Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Um, I'd like to now introduce our guest speaker for the month of July, and that's Beth B. speaking on sets 1, 2, and 3. Come on, I'm not ready for three. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Beth, and I am an alcoholic and an addict. And uh, I want to say that, you know, um, I normally introduce myself like that unless it's really, really clear that that's going to really bother people. Um, and I do it more for my own benefit than anything else. Well, I do everything in this program for my own benefit, at least as much as anyone else. Um, it's a reminder to me that my problem is alcohol and so much more. And, uh, you know, we, we say in the beginning of every meeting that our primary purpose is to achieve sobriety and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And that is my primary purpose. But for me, sobriety is about so much more than not drinking. And for me to achieve sobriety, I found that I had to stop taking drugs. <laughs> I know that seems obvious. <laughs> well, you know, and it's, and it's a funny thing. And, and I had a sponsor um, for my first, well, for nearly my first number of years um, who was very wise, and she taught me a lot. And one of the earliest things she told me that the name of my disease is not drug addiction or alcoholism. The name of my disease is never enough. And so... I sure do welcome the chance to spend four hours telling you about me, because it's never enough. <laughs> I share speaking commitments with people, and it's like this 20-minute thing. It's just not enough. And, um, you know, not only do I find my life interesting, I find other people's lives interesting. We alcoholics have led very colorful lives for the most part. And when they're not colorful on the outside stuff, they're sure colorful on the inside stuff. So, um I guess um, I guess I'll, I'll introduce myself a little bit and say um, I, I didn't come from an alcoholic family. Um, nobody in my family, in many generations, and even you know, including cousins and aunts and uncles, nobody had a problem with drugs or alcohol. Um, I'm not saying they were perfect. <laughs> There are many, many different versions of neurosis in my family, but nothing um, nothing that's truly physically harmful, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, in fact, my parents uh, raised me with a lot of love and support. And I say this, you know, in, in a real way. They always taught me from the beginning, from the day I was born, that there was nothing I couldn't do, you know. And... Um, and in a sense, that's one of the tools that I used to survive was knowing that there's nothing that I can't do. And in a sense, it was the first thing I had to put down when I came into recovery was saying, you know what, this one I can't do. And so, so that's been a real big part of my recovery is daily reminding myself that this is the one thing I can't do myself. I need a lot of help. I mean, I need everybody here's help. I need everybody around me's help. You know, I was just talking to Karen about, you know, before the meeting about how, you know, God has put people in my life to help me tonight. You know, my babysitter fell through. I missed my train. All those things happened. And it, everything just fell into place. Like, it ended up to be actually a more graceful solution than it started out being. And, you know, and, and it's just people even not in the program. And it's because... 
I truly think it's because today I've learned to live in this world. I've learned to be like a member of society, like to show up every day and do human stuff. You know, and when I do human stuff for other people, they do that stuff back. That's what people do. See, I didn't come from that. And so um, so I'll take you a little bit through um, what I normally would call my war stories that I don't like to go into detail on. But um, but it started, um, it started before alcohol. It always starts before alcohol, right? And it started with me thinking that I was missing something always. It felt like I was just outside. Um, even as a kid, you know, I, I felt like I wasn't fast enough, I wasn't popular enough, I wasn't pretty enough, like, whatever it was, I just felt like I wasn't, and I, I think that was 99% my, you know, head telling me that, and probably only 1% true, but at the time, it felt real to me, and I didn't know how to deal with it, and I kind of dealt with it by acting as if, I learned about acting as if, I learned about when someone said something that everyone thought was funny, everyone laughed. And I laugh. And so I learned about, you know, how to how to make people laugh by saying stuff that other people thought was funny. And um, so I learned about that, you know, being what people wanted me to be. And I, I learned it. I learned that very early. And um, you know, I guess by the time I was, how old I must have been, maybe twelve. I'm going to say I had already discovered cigarettes. That was probably my first high was inhaling a cigarette and coughing and then, you know, seeing stars. Um, and quickly afterwards discovered beer. And, you know, for me, beer wasn't in my parents' house because um, they didn't drink. They truly, like, they had a liquor cabinet, but I think the bottles were dusty in there. Like, they brought it out, like, on holidays. I don't know when they brought it out. It was very rarely brought out. The same bottle, probably people gave them bottles for presents and then, you know, when the people came over, they remembered probably who gave them what bottle and brought it out, you know. My parents didn't drink. And so <laughs> so uh, the way we discovered beer was it was in someone else's house. And, you know, so I was friends with some kids. I, I was living on Long Island and a uh, nice community. And right down the block from my house was this big wooded area. It was actually part of a bridal path where horses came from a state park. And... Um, so it was this big wooded area, and it was fenced in because it was only supposed to be for the state park. But, of course, you know, we were kids, and we knew where the holes in the fence was. And so one of my friends would, you know, grab some beers from their parents' fridge, and we would sneak back there. And what I found out really quickly was I could drink with my friends, and they got all silly and stupid, and sometimes they even got sick. And I didn't. I just felt kind of lightheaded and kind of fun. I didn't, um, it's funny because I had like the opposite reaction of a lot of alcoholics. Um, I rarely got sick. I didn't black out. I just, I just felt real good. And people started to like to drink with me at 12 years old because <laughs> I could handle my booze, you know. And so if someone's parents came out and found us, I could quickly say something that was going to make the parents feel okay. Oh, yeah, we were out here because someone's dog ran away and we were looking for the dog, you know, um, whatever it was. And, and I didn't act silly. And so, so finally I had found something I was talented at that other people weren't talented at. And, and it kind of continued for a long time. Um, I never saw myself, it's funny because I grew up in the 70s and, um, this was the early 70s when I was discovering this stuff and, I always knew that it would be uh, drugs for me, but I didn't think like drugs like shooting up. I thought, you know, acid and mushrooms. I re you know, I, it was like that whole hippie thing was very attractive to me. And I always saw that being in my future. And uh, so I, I met a girl, you know, it's funny, like it's silly. And I thought, oh, the whole peace movement and everything. I was like, and you know, my parents, you know, raised me kind of with that politics. And so... Um, I met a girl who was in the next town over, and she dressed kind of like a hippie. We were 13, you know. And uh, we went away to summer camp together, and she brought all this pot. And uh, I don't know how she hooked it up, because she was obviously my mentor of uh, <laughs> of drinking and drugging. But she hooked up with two guys that were teenagers, like 17-year-old guys, who worked in the kitchen of 
a neighboring camp that was for old people, and they had this kosher wine, gallons of it. So we would meet every day, you know, at various points when we had free time and, you know, smoke pot and drink wine. And two things, you know, really that are important about that experience for me, um, the first one was that it just gave me this beautiful, warm feeling that for the rest of my life I tried to get back. Just this real, just sitting in the woods, really with these people I hardly knew. You know, I probably had no business being with these teenage boys that came from like inner city neighborhood, you know. But anyway, here I was, you know, hanging out and just felt so good and so like everything was right. And the other thing that's important about it is we were sneaking away. I think for my entire career of drinking, it was the hiding, it was the chasing, it was the knowing that I was not going to get caught, you know. It was just like that feeling of, you know, I can get away with this. That really was a big part of my whole entire drinking and drugging history. And, uh, and that's really, and that's really what set the pace for that. And, um, you know, I went a lot of years, um, you know, after that, really being what would be known as a pothead. You know, I just smoked pot all the time. And it was real mellow and, you know, quiet and ate a lot of munchies and <laughs> did all of that. And I sold it. You know, it was a, a big thing. And I was, I always did well in school, so it never, my life was clearly not unmanageable. Um, but I could smoke pot and study all night, you know. And, uh, and it really didn't come in, it, it really didn't harm me in any way that was obvious to me at the time. And I thought, you know, they're so wrong about all these things they say about drugs, you know. And I would drink, um, if it was like, you know, dances or something, I would drink, you know, and, and I didn't drink out of hand. And I really didn't consider alcoholism as, you know, anything I was ever going to worry about. And I went on for years and years like that, you know. And that's why, you know, I'm always amazed that I ended up here. Because for years I just, you know, I did what I did, you know, and, uh, yeah, probably I was depriving myself, probably, like, I could have gone so much further, maybe I would have discovered the cure for cancer if I wasn't, you know, busy burning out my brain cells, but, you know, basically, it wasn't really all that unmanageable, I mean, maybe I could have got A's instead of B's, I don't know, but, you know, it was really very manageable for me, um, except I'll say with personal relations. And personal relations are always what trips us up um, pretty much from the beginning. Pretty much everybody has this. You know, I always, I saw myself as really like a social person, pot smoking, very social activity, passing it around, everything like that, very social thing. Um, what I didn't realize until many years later was I was slowly but surely eliminating people from my life that couldn't drink and drug with me. And I didn't realize it um, um, until much later, actually, when I came around to doing the eighth step. When I was in sobriety and came around to doing the eighth step and thought, who am I going to put on my list? I could hardly think of anything until I thought of one person. I thought of the few obvious ones, of course. I had the list, you know, the family, the very close friends, the bosses. But there was one, I started to think back in my history, and there was one really obvious one. She was a very close friend of mine in high school, and I thought, why am I not friends with her? Did we have a fight? I hadn't thought of her in, you know, 15 years. What happened? And I started racking my brain trying to think, and I really couldn't think of it. And I thought, I think I probably owe her an amends. I must have done something really awful to her, because... I don't remember what I did. And uh, so I went to my high school 20th re reunion back in, date myself, 19, 1997. And uh, I went specifically to see this person. And she went really because she was hoping to see me. Because we had both moved around so many times and, you know, it's hard to keep track of people. And this was... You know, the Internet was up and running by 97, but not well. You know, you couldn't really do those big searches. And uh, so we saw each other, and she was so happy to see me and everything, and I thought, maybe I'm wrong, right? And when uh, I got her to the side and I said, you know, what happened? 
why were we friends all through high school and yet never once called each other as soon as we, like, spoke to Summer? And she said, oh, well, you know, you kind of eliminated me from your life because you were just, like, into all these just buying pot, smoking pot, all the time, you know. And I said, you're kidding. Like, I don't even remember. I actually just stopped returning her calls for no reason at all. And I said, that's really an odd thing. And then she said, not only that, I bumped into her down on Wall Street years later, like 10 years after we graduated. And she gave me a big greeting, and I completely walked away from her. So I did it even again, you know. <laughs> and so I guess that's, you know, that was a big part of my story was um, I made friends. If they didn't party with me, it was okay with me if they just went a different way. And uh, and so I don't have a lot of old friends in my life. I kind of we've lost track of each other. So this has been something I've tried to correct in sobriety, you know. But um, but so that was you know so but all very you know very manageable, not really unmanageable at all. Um, I went on for for years like that um, until I reached a point. I don't know how to explain it. I reached the point I was with a guy. I was with him for a number of years, many years. And we got along great. You know, we both drank a little, smoked a little pot. He played guitar. I used to like listening. You know, it was a wonderful little relationship until we discovered cocaine. And the funny thing about what happened at that moment was he opened his mouth and he started talking. I was with this guy for 12 years. I don't think he hardly said anything for the 12 years. <laughs> it was that 12th year was the killer. He started talking, and he wouldn't stop talking. <laughs> and I realized I never even liked him. I never even knew him. <laughs> uh, we had lived together, you know, I mean, so, um, but I realized I didn't like him. And, uh, and so he had to go his way, and I went mine. And that's really when my drinking took off. And really, you know, I was already, by that point, 29. I was 29, and my drinking really took off. Um, and, and and I had already, oh, I want, I want to say one more thing about, you know, the whole college and drug phase before I move out of that. Um, I always was a little worse than everyone else. It was just like I drank beer and then didn't act silly and stupid and didn't get sick. Same thing happened to me with everything else. And so I had that problem. I would take hallucinogenic, and other people would take the same. And they'd all be like, wow, there's spiders on the wall, and you see that purple blob? And I was like, no, give me another one. And so I would do another one. And so I always had to do twice as much as everyone else. And it didn't make any sense. I was smaller. I was, you know... Female, usually females have a lower tolerance, and I don't know, I just, people were dropping out of college, they were, you know, having mental breakdowns from all the things we were experimenting with, and it never happened to me. Um, and in fact, I had uh, a funny thing happen to me my last day at um, my first year of college. The last day, it was the final day of finals, and we had to do these blue book tests where you have to write, you know, all this stuff, and... Um, we had all made a deal in my dorm that after our final final, we were all going to meet in this wooded area behind the school and all drop acid together. And in fact, we highlighted by saying, you know what we're going to do? An hour into our last test, because they were two-hour tests, we're going to drop it. And that way, when it kicks in, we'll know it's time to go out to the lake, right? So, so of course, I did that. And my last test, God knows, you know, what I wrote, but, you know, I did okay. And it was only until many years later, I was talking to an old friend of mine, and I said, wow, wasn't that really funny that day when we all, you know, did this during our last test and then met out by the lake? And he said to me, what are you talking about? So I, you know, repeated it and said, well, we didn't really do that. <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, well, we all waited until we got there and then did it, right? And I'm like, you mean I, I was the only one that did that, right, <laughs> that took it in the class while I was taking my test. Like, I didn't get that, that other people were not doing this the way I was doing it, you know. And uh, 
and it was like that all the time for me. Um, you know, I had a lot of different experiences like that. You know, I was in a, um, how can I explain this? I was in a movie theater watching a S&M movie. <laughs> and it was a very gross, disgusting movie. And I didn't tell my friends next to me that the people on the other side of me were passing me a type of something different in it until I started having violent reactions to the terrible gore on the screen, and they were like, what's going on? And then I didn't want to tell them that I wasn't including them in my other party, you know. So I tried to cover for it. So, you know, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, so so somehow, somehow the message I got from all of those years was, it's not working for me enough. I need to, like, do more. I need to, it wasn't ever I need to do less. It was always I need to do more. I need to do more different things altogether. And somehow that's the message I got. And uh, so then that's what I'm 29, and um, I'm now alone. I was this guy from 12 years that we talked. And, uh, <laughs> and now, you know, what do I do? I, I've been alone since I'm 17, and so I uh, so I went to bars. And that's really, really when my drinking took off. And, you know, I learned how to drink to excess. I mean, I learned how to drink like a bottomless pit. And um, that was the only way I knew how to drink at that point. It's funny because all the years before, I never drank like that. And then all of a sudden, it was like I woke up and discovered my true calling. And that was drinking until there was no more booze left in the bar. And... You know, if it was an expensive bar, it was, you know, drinking before I went to the bar. You know, and uh, and then, and then of course, ultimately, I found that there were many bars that I didn't have to pay money at. I could just be friendly with the bartender. And so those became my favorite bars. And, um, <laughs> and those bars, um, I lived in Staten Island at the time, and I worked down on Wall Street, and those bars were... Usually in the daytime, they were like Irish old man kind of bars. And then in the nighttime, they went into like biker bars. And I felt very comfortable in both crowds because in the daytime, in the daytime, there were all these old guys, and they were really happy to buy me drinks all day. And then in the nighttime, there were these big, giant, ugly biker dudes that would come in, and they would never think of charging me. We all got high together and everything. And... So I never really paid actually for drinks at bars, and that allowed me, I figured that allowed me to drink forever. So I would generally get to the bar immediately after work, walk off the train and walk into the bar. My car would be parked right there because the train station was there, and uh, start drinking with the old men, you know, 6 o'clock in the evening, and by 9 o'clock the bikers are coming in, and now I'm keeping on drinking with them. And uh, eventually we'd close the bar and clean up afterwards and, you know, so I'd go, ah, you know, it's five in the morning. i got to go home and take a shower. i got to catch a 7.30 train. And so I started doing that. And what I noticed about my friends at that point in my life was none of them had regular jobs like me. <laughs> so, you know, it was funny because all my friends were these people that hung out in these biker bars all night, every night. You know, I didn't have a weekend, and uh, they didn't have regular jobs. That's not loud enough, huh? How'd I go like this? this? Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, what I what I noticed was um, none of my friends had regular jobs like me. They all were bartenders or drug dealers or dancers or, you know, they just had uh, unusual jobs. Some of them were connected in different ways. Um, <laughs> but they didn't work regular jobs. I was the only one that was leaving at 5 in the morning to go home and take a shower and come back to the train. And often at 5 in the morning when I left the bar, I couldn't find my key. And it was a problem because I had parked my car out there at 7 in the morning for the train and now I needed to drive my car home. I lived, you know, eight blocks away. I couldn't find my keys. So I'd end up, like, walking home from the bar to have to walk back an hour later to catch the train. 
And then at some point, someone cleaning up the bar would find my keys, and, yes, I'd get there six the next evening. So that became my cycle, you know, kind of from end to end. So you wonder, how did I get from seven in the morning to six in the evening without drinking? That must be what you're wondering, right? And the answer is, I didn't. <laughs> the answer is, I worked down on Wall Street, and then back in the 80s, we all drank during the day. <laughs> it was totally cool to have drinks at lunch. People, uh, people that made a lot of money had martinis, and people that didn't make a lot of money went to McCann's and had a burger and some beers, some fat beers, you know. So um, it totally, uh, it, it totally all went together. And then I, uh, and I did always um, smoke pot as soon as I woke up in the morning, and uh, more on the boat. I take the ferry, the Staten Island ferry, over to work. And at one point, I don't know how it came up, but one of my friends said, you know, let's have a couple of beers on the morning boat. Why not? So there I am on an 8.15 ferry in the morning, smoking a joint and drinking a beer every day. And I thought, see, this is what life is all about. I thought this is the way regular people live. They hang out all day in biker bars. They smoke pot and drink beer on the ferry, you know, and they're sneaking down alleyways on Wall Street smoking and drinking during lunch. I thought that's actually what people do. I thought anybody that didn't do that was very strange because everybody I knew did like that because, like I said, everybody who didn't do like that, I just eliminated them. I just didn't see them anymore. They didn't exist. And uh, I lived that way for a long time um, few years anyway, you know, the morning beers, the, you know, all that whole deal for a long time. Um, and, and a funny thing happened to me after I got sober. In the first few months after I got sober, I worked for a, a foreign bank, a Japanese bank, and uh, we were getting audited by the Federal Reserve, which is, you know, the government agency that uh, oversees banks. And they were coming to my bank, and they were told by the auditors, from the previous years to come see me that I was in charge or that I was the only one that spoke English that was in charge. And so they came to see me and uh, introduced themselves and we all exchanged business cards. And one guy was looking at me kind of funny and, you know, he said to me, uh, you look familiar to me. Uh, you live on Staten Island? So I said, uh, yeah, I do. That's a small place. So everybody knows everybody, you know. So I said, you know, I thought maybe I knew somebody that he knew. And so I said, yeah, I do. Uh, he keeps looking at me, and he goes, uh, I think it's 8.15 boat in the morning. So I said, uh, yeah, you know, still I'm not, I'm not alarmed because, of course, I think, every, you know, even in sobriety, I didn't realize how abnormal my life was. I was only sober but a few months. And I said, yeah, you know, I took the 8.15 boat. And then he said to me, did you used to always stand on the bottom level on the right-hand side by the water fountain there? And all of a sudden, I got it. And I thought, shoot, <laughs> Can I, I'll clean it up a little. This guy is auditing my bank, and I'm in charge of, like, millions and millions and millions of dollars daily, and he knows that I drank and smoked pot every morning at 8.15. And that's when, like, the, you know, in sobriety, it all came gradually to me. I didn't get it when I first got sober that there was anything wrong. And, you know, stuff like that happened. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy could totally bust me. And, you know, the fact was that I was living a clean and sober life at that point, but a few months. And not only was I doing things at the bank that I probably shouldn't have been doing, <laughs> but I was literally stealing much when I was, you know, not sober. And uh, embezzlement from a bank is a pretty heavy thing to do, and I was not looking forward to being caught at that. And, you know, I kind of turned red and, you know, excused myself and went to the ladies' room and said a little prayer, and I said, you know what, what happens is going to happen. You know, he knows. I can't really deny it. And and I went back to my desk, and I did my work, and he never said another word. You know, and 
you know, my story could have ended up so different. I could have been one of those people like many of us who got sober only to find themselves in jail. You know, to get away with it all those years of drinking and then go to jail in sobriety. It happens to people. That could have been my story. Somehow, that wasn't my story. And so, um, so I got sober. Um, I got sober. I didn't want to get sober, let's just say. <laughs> I didn't believe drinking was my problem. Um, everyone else was my problem. I thought that was clear, you know. Um, <laughs> now, I'll just say by this point, by these last, the last two years for me were very ugly. Um, the last two years for me, I discovered what became my final drug of choice, which was free-based cocaine. And um, I remember uh, hearing someone say once, when someone says those words, you know they're getting to the end of their story. Because so, <laughs> there's, there's only but so long you could go on doing that. And that really was, you know, what made me start stealing was, you know, literally the expense involved. You know, um, I couldn't imagine losing my job. I had such an expensive habit. But um, but things started happening to me more uh, more frequently once that came into the picture. I still started out every night, same way, 6 o'clock, go to the, you know, Irish old man's bar, you know, turn into the biker bar. Everybody's cool. You know, everybody's hanging out together. Everybody's getting high. I just had a problem at 2 in the morning. I would get this little itch and, you know, head down the wrong road and call up the wrong people and just do the wrong thing. And every night I went out and I told myself, I'm not going to do that again. And every night I went out and I did it again. And uh, got to the point where I had to do it all day, too, because, you know, like you might imagine, I couldn't wait from 7 to 6 <laughs> to do that. And so I spent half my day at work, you know, uh, calling up dealers from Staten Island and trying to get them to deliver to the World Trade Center, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And then, you know, um, not just, and then it became not just drinking during the day, which, you know, was already starting not to be okay in the 90s. But, um, but you know, smoking crack in the bathrooms is never, never a good way to hold your job. <laughs> And uh, and did that all the time, and somehow you know kept it together at work. And I thought nobody noticed. You know, later on, of course, I realized that people were noticing. They might not have known what to call it or what you know to to, to say what it was, but they knew something was wrong. You know, I was, so I was very arrogant about you know being able to do everything myself. Again, I was brought up with that, and uh, just you know kind of told people to get off my back. You know, took care of everything. Everything's great. You know. And of course, everything was not great. You know, I was, um, I didn't go home after the bar closed because, you know, I was lonely. You know, I was looking for love in the all the wrong places, right? And so, uh, you know, trying to meet Mr. Wright in a bar at four in the morning on a Tuesday morning. You know, he's not there. He's sleeping, you know. <laughs> he's getting ready to get up and go to work, you know. So, uh, so that was my, um, you know, so became, and I was becoming more and more frustrated with the kinds of relationships I was having with men and women and, uh, you know, fraught with all kinds of tension and anger and rage on all of our parts, you know, because it always ended up to be screwed up. And, uh, and, you know, stuff started to happen. And one of the things that started to happen was, Again, I always had to do twice as much as everyone else, and that's why I paid twice as much as everyone else. And uh, one time, you know, I um, I did inhale and didn't exhale. I went into seizure and almost died and uh, and lost, you know, I, I guess my heart had stopped, whatever. And my new boyfriend at the time um, went down on his knees into CPR for me and uh you know, I remember I woke up and, you know, I was laying on the floor. I couldn't figure out why I was laying on the floor. And, you know, they and my friends um, said, wow, you just about, like, died there. And uh, I said, what do you mean? And they said, you know, you've been down for 10 minutes there, not breathing. And I said, uh, 10 minutes? 
we better pass that stuff right down here because I couldn't stand up. Because <laughs> I said, I must have missed a few rounds. And, you know, could you pass me my drink? You know, and uh, they were pretty alarmed at that. <laughs> And it started a whole, it started the whole final horrid phase of my drinking, which was going out on like four day binges. Because I couldn't, even my friends wouldn't let me drink or get high with them. They wouldn't even let me drink with them anymore. It got to the point where no one could be with me. And so, you know, just like it says in the book, I sought out sorted places. You know, I went down to the projects and I found myself, you know, empty buildings with people that hung out in them. You know, um, did what I, you know, what I wanted to do, and just, you know, reach the point where I would just sit there and just get high and drink and just cry. And you know, by that point, you know, I'm not drinking my favorite Stolies, which I love so well. You know, I'm drinking the 40 ounce malt liquor with everyone else down the projects because that's what I was, you know, that's what I could afford at that point because of the volume I was doing, and. Um, and it was all, you know, um, it was all the most insane thing. Um, that part of my life, you know, I think of it a lot. And I think of it and I share it a lot because that part of my life was so ugly that I have to remember at every moment, this is not for me about ever being able to drink again because I know for sure where drinking took me. And, uh, you know, um, I look back at those times when I used to go out for four days. Um, my weekends would start on a Thursday, you know, and I would call in sick on Friday and kind of somehow stumble into work Monday but not ever go home and then just keep going Monday night and somehow get home Monday night. And, uh, you know, I was, um, I was thin because, of course, I never ate. <laughs> and uh, I thought I looked so great. I was so hot, you know. And, uh, I was not hot. <laughs> I mean, let me just tell you, I was I was a skeleton. I was not in good shape at all. And you know, I would go out for four days, and to me, it was one day. I didn't realize that the day was you know turning. A toothbrush didn't touch my lips. A hairbrush didn't touch my hair. I was not hot, but I thought I was. And of course, the people I was with thought I was too. You know, because they were the same. <laughs> We stunk. I mean, you know, it was a bad situation. And uh, <laughs> one of one of the funny stories that I didn't think of till years later. Again, all these things I think of years later. And one of the funny stories that happened to me was um, it was a Halloween, and I went to a Halloween party with all my drinking friends, and we got drunk. And I wore a skeleton outfit because I was skinny. Then I could wear this little one-piece jumpsuit skeleton outfit, and I. Uh, Went out in the skeleton outfit, and of course, after the party, I said I was going to go home, but I didn't go home. And I went out um, to, you know, the places I shouldn't have been at. And uh, I guess, you know, some time later, my husband came. Well, we weren't married yet. We were still boyfriend and girlfriend. He came to pick me up, and he used to come down the project where I used to go. Um, he used to come down. He was a very big, tall, Irish-looking guy, and uh, he had a gun. It was an illegal gun, but it was a gun. And he used to come down to the project and park his car, straddle the car the middle of the street, and get out of the car and stand there with his, his hands on his hips with his gun on the side of him. And everybody would think he was a cop. And he, and he would wait until I'd come around the bend, because I would always come around the bend. And he would, um, and he would, you know, he would be straddled across the street, so I'd have to stop. And then I would get out, and I'd go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I, I'm so bad, you know. And uh, so this one time I did that, I got out of the car to say that, and it was this, like, vinyl Halloween outfit. And, like, half the, the outfit got stuck on the car seat because it had the black vinyl car seat. And I was sweating in this thing for four days. I didn't even know it, you know. And he said to me, and I didn't even know at that moment, I I thought, oh, I must be sweating a lot, you know, and it fell off. I mean, these were not well-made outfits. And then and then he said to me, what's wrong with you? Are you crazy? What's And, and I said to him, what's the big deal? And he's like, look at you, you're in a skeleton outfit. And I said, so? I went to a Halloween party. And he goes, Beth, it's November 3rd. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> phew. <laughs> So uh, I thought, wow, that's why everybody gave me those strange looks in the ATM machine every two hours, you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's where it took me. And, and it's funny to think of now, but, you know, um, some pretty ugly places that I went to. And, you know, um, I had no fear. Um, I wasn't afraid of dying. I just assumed I was going to die. I mean, I had, you know, I was aware by that point that death was going to happen for me. You know, I had already laid down on the floor and went into seizure and almost died. I was very aware that death was going to happen for me. And uh, and he was too, my boyfriend, and he used to, uh, I had all the bars speed dialed on my phone, you know, for the speed dials, and he used to uh, change them and reprogram them to all the hospitals and police stations. And I would disappear and he would call them all and say, you know, do you have someone that looks like this and do you see anybody that looks like that and how about this car and, you know, um, when I think about, you know, what I did to him, you know, it just, it's just hard for me to, to reconcile that I would put someone through so much. And, you know, after the time when he did CPR on me, the few times I did fall asleep, he would um, wake me up through the night. Every, like, half hour, he would shake me. Are you alive? Are you alive? Say something. Because, you know, how when you, when you sleep, your breath gets very low, quiet, and low. He would think I was dead. And that's, you know, and that's where, that's where drinking took me, was, you know, that the person, that I finally found love, right? I finally found the one. And here I am, he's waking me up every half hour when I showed up at home, you know, the rare time, to see if I'm still alive, you know. So, um, so that's the thing, you know, it just, all I ever wanted in my whole life was to feel connected, was to feel part of something, was to, you know, be one among many. Or one among two. You know what I mean? And I just, you know, I just couldn't get that. And, you know, he started um, harassing me to call rehabs, and so I would call him, you know, and of course I would tell him I'm a binge cocaine user, and nah, I don't really drink a lot, you know. Um, no, nah, I don't do heroin, you know. And they'd say, yeah, all right, well, you're on the waiting list, you know. They would wait with me. And so he'd come home later and he'd find me high and he'd say, what did you do? Well, I called and, you know, they said they don't have any room for binge cocaine users, you know. And uh, to some extent that was true. Um, then, you know, I tried therapy. I, you know, he started giving me all the ultimatums. And I don't I don't know why he, he you know, obviously loved me too. And uh, finally, you know, um, yeah, I went to the therapist. That, that was a whole other not working thing. Um, that was just a whole other way for me to, like, think I had control over everything. And uh, finally he, you know, said to me, I'm going to tell your parents what you're doing. I hadn't lived with my parents in many years. And so I said, uh, no, you won't. And he said, yeah, I'm done. And sure enough, my parents show up this one day, and they said, we know what you're doing. And I said, he did it. He made me get high, and now he got me addicted. And uh, <laughs> and they said, no, we know it's you, and we need you to go to rehab. And I went to rehab, and, um, you know, I'm grateful I went to rehab. I didn't learn a lot of recovery there. I got a lot of good group therapy. I went to Fair Oak, and uh, they had that guy, uh, Mark something, the guy that did the 1-800-cocaine that you were talking about, and they... You know, one thing about Fair Oaks, I found out I was in a small group, and I found out that everybody in the group had a diagnosis of a mental illness, and they were all getting medicated. And I found out, you know, I was in a room full of 10 people, and they were all taking medicine except me. Well, I didn't like that. So I went to the shrink, and I demanded my medicine. I said, you know, when I came here, you said I was manic depressive. I should get medicine. So they gave me lithium, you know. All right. It's looking for you. But uh, I don't know if I needed it or not, you know, but it just it just made me feel like, wait a second, they're all taking pills every day. I need to take a pill every day. Like, I had no idea what sobriety was all about. And, uh, you know, and that's, and that's how it was, you know. Um, I came in. I wanted to do as little as I needed to do just to get people off my back. I never had intentions of stopping drinking or drugging. Because I didn't surrender, you know. I surrendered to the circumstance, but not to the problem. And 
you know, um, uh, you know, one thing I was sharing with Kathy before the meeting started was, you know, in 1993 was when I got sober, and two months after was when the World Trade Center was bombed, and, you know, I was in there and walked down 80 flights of steps, and, and I went to rehab that night, and because uh, they wouldn't let me out of it, and uh, and they said, you know, well, in my first 90 days, I got married, I went to five weddings, you know, I did all the things you're not supposed to do, I went to parties, you know and uh, you're going to get it, and your big lump or whatever. And, you know, it was really nothing like that. But on my day 91, you know, I had heard about the 90-day thing around here. So on my, day, on my day 90, I didn't share. I didn't tell anybody it was my 90 days. I didn't even go to a meeting on my 90th day. And uh, I went to a wedding instead, another wedding. And uh, on day 91, I woke up and I said, you know, I'm going out for some milk. And I got the milk, actually, but uh, a few hundred dollars and 12 hours later, I returned home, truly beaten and actually surrendered. And, you know, I don't recommend relapse as um, as a way to surrender around here, but it was what I needed because it was just in that 12 hours that I realized that whatever I was doing out there, had ceased to be the party a long time ago. It really, it was that 12 hours that let me understand that my party had ended five, six years before, and I didn't even know it. And everybody around me knew it. That's why they wouldn't drink with me anymore, you know. And uh, and so, and that was what I needed. And I went to a meeting and I told my story of my relapse because that was what I suggested to do. And when I finished my story, I was crying. And I noticed in the room there were all these people crying. And that was the first time I felt identification with other people on such a deep level. And um, and I felt home. It felt like I finally came home. And uh, and that's, you know, and it's funny because it, um, in the big book it says, once in a while he may tell the truth. <laughs> right? That's one of my favorite lines. And uh, and something after the, on that 91st day made me dig down deep inside of me and tell the real truth. And that was probably the first time I ever did it in many, many years. And I told them what made me tick, and I told them about me. And, and I felt like the weight being lifted from me. I felt like, I felt like the hope. And, um, and it was, and it was enough, it was enough to, to keep me coming for sure, but it was enough to make me search for something better. See, because it's never enough, right? Remember I told you the name of my disease is never enough, right? So, um, so now I said, okay, I'm surrendering my alcohol. What can I do to make my whole life better? And you know what they did? They told me, you know, we have this book here, a big book, and uh, it's a good idea to read it and, you know, work with a sponsor. Wow. You know, okay, I can read a book, you know. So I was like, okay with that. Somehow in rehab, they, you know, barely mention anything about that book. And, you know, and, and so that's really, you know, that was a big, huge thing for me was I started to search for something deeper. It wasn't just I need a way to stop. See, I first came into the program the first few months was I didn't even want to stop drinking. I just wanted to stop the pain from happening. And then on that 91st day, I knew that I wanted to stop the drinking. But after I shared with those people on that night, I knew that I wanted something more. I wanted my life to be okay. I wanted to feel connected. And that's really when I started searching. And I went around for a long time to meetings around Staten Island. Not for a long time. After that point, it was only like another month or two um, to meetings. And I kept hearing, you know, don't drink and go to meetings, bring the body and the mind will follow and all this other stuff. And I didn't get it. I knew that wasn't my solution. I knew that wasn't going to be what was going to keep me okay. And... Um, I don't know how, you know, God works on these things, but one day I got dropped off 
One night I got dropped off at a meeting in Sea Caucus, New Jersey. How I came to be there is my parents lived there at the time, and one night we went out for dinner. I wasn't going to go to a meeting that night, but I was feeling, I was, you know, feeling okay. And uh, they didn't think I was feeling okay. <laughs> and they said, we think you need to go to a meeting. And I said, well, you know, I mean, by the time we get back to Staten Island and I get to my meeting, you know, it's going to be too late. And they said, uh, oh, no, right here in the glove compartment we have the meeting list in New Jersey. <laughs> Yeah, you got to love family, right? <laughs> so uh, I said, well, you know, and they said, well, there's this meeting that's right in our town, and it starts in another 10 minutes, and uh, great. So I looked at the meeting book, and it said it's an open meeting and, uh, you know, discussion, and I said, and I didn't know what, you know, the BB meant from it. You know, I had no idea. And I said, uh, you know, I hate open speaker meetings. They just they make me want to drink. I don't even bother, you know. And they dropped me over this meeting, and I heard things that I never heard before. And um, one of the things that I heard that changed my life is um, a, an older woman that was one of the founders of the group said, the time of your death has been changed. And when she said that to me, well, that's, that's all she said. And she said it to the whole group, although it really felt like she was looking at me. I felt like not only was she saying that I could be dead right now, but somehow I understood that she was saying that my life was saved for a reason. That it was my, the time of my death was not changed so I could get a better car. You know what I mean? And I knew that. And I don't know why I knew that because that's all she said. The time of your death has changed. And I immediately knew that what she was talking about was my time was changed so that I could get sober and help other people to achieve sobriety. And I can't explain how I knew that, you know, and um, and that was and that was how I came in. And you know, people told me um, I was told by this group I was handed the 12 and 12 book and the other books too, and I was told to read all the books, but specifically for the 12 and 12 books to read a step every day. And then I said, you know, what do I do after the 12th day? And they said, uh, read it again. And I said, how long do I do this for? And I figured they were going to say 90 days. And they said. Uh, so further notice, you know. So I checked with another person from the group, and they said the same thing, and, you know, <laughs> kind of a consistent deal. So I said, uh, well, you know, I don't even understand stuff in step seven and eight. And with, you know, I'm just new. And they said, don't worry. We didn't tell you to understand it. We just told you to read it, you know. And so I learned discipline, and I learned to open my mind. And really that's what step two became for me was opening my mind thinking that there could be a possibility of something better if I'll let it happen. And that's really um, that's really how I got to see step two. And um, you know, and I and I tried um, I tried to pay attention. I wasn't raised with religion. Um, both my parents were um, Jewish of birth, but neither was raised with any religion and they didn't raise me with any. Um, in fact, kind of, you could say atheist. They taught me that I could do anything myself, right? And so now here I was in a situation I needed to, like they said, have that mustard seed of faith. And it says in the book, am I, am I, do I believe or am I willing to believe in a power greater than myself? And I reached the point where I was willing to believe. I didn't believe. And, you know, I, I, questioned a lot of stuff, and I, you know, went to a lot of the people that had time, and, you know, I picked a sponsor who was really good, and I said, what do I do? And they all said, just keep reading a step a day. Just keep getting down on your knees twice a day, 20 minutes at a time, and pray. I said, well, I can't do that. And they said, hey, do whatever you can do. Just pray twice a day. And I said, you know, what kind of prayer? They said, doesn't matter what kind of prayer. But I didn't have any experience. I didn't have a set of prayers. I got a couple from the program, you know. And I said, you know, who am I praying to? And they said, uh, I remember one guy said to me, it doesn't matter who's listening to your prayers. I'm going to tell you that what matters is if you get on your knees twice a day and pray, your life will get better. And I had the open mind to believe that because their life was getting better. 
you know, and I thought, okay, I'll pray twice a day, you know. Um, the knee thing has never been good for me, <laughs> but I'll talk about that another time. Um, but all I had to do was just allow myself the chance, and that's what I learned from this program. It's just, just to allow myself the chance and let the higher power, God, do the work. You know, and uh, and it's been such a miracle. I mean, every day is a miracle, and um, you know, every day I I give thanks so many times throughout the day. I mean, now I don't even like have real organized twice a day prayer. It's like throughout the day because I can't even believe what God had in store for me. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like. It's more than I could have ever imagined. And, um, and so now, you know, I have, I have a faith that it will be better even if I just keep coming. You know, that's all I have. Thanks. Which one? Three, four, and five. Okay, sorry guys. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Beth and I am an addict and alcoholic. And uh, I'm honored to be here for the second week um, running um, because I think this is a great group. And I think, um, you know, I think it's wonderful that more and more groups are really focusing in on the recovery, you know, um, for, you know, and I shared this a little bit last week, for the first couple of months that I was um, coming around the room, I was going to a lot of rooms with speakers and some with discussions, and it, uh, you know, they used to talk a lot about the don't drink and go to meetings and, you know, bring the body and the mind will follow and, you know, all that stuff. and. I really thought in the very first couple of months that you could get sober by just coming around church basements an hour a night and drinking coffee. And I thought, I could do that. That's something I could do, you know, until I found myself drunk. And then I realized, you know, that it's like they say in the uh, in the book, drinking is but a symptom, you know. And... Uh, and, you know, last week I shared a little bit about, you know, why I introduced myself as an addict and alcoholic because my problem is, you know, more than alcohol. My problem includes a lot of drugs. And, you know, I want to also say that my problem includes a lot of other things <laughs> besides drugs and alcohol. And, uh, you know, I can, you know, when my sponsor told me that my pro the name of my disease was never enough, she wasn't talking specifically about chemicals and substances. What she was telling me was I got to be careful all the time. You know, I got to be careful with all my relationships with people that they don't become addictive. I had to be careful with everything. And, you know, today in sobriety, you know, sometimes I see myself acting a little abnormally. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, for, for the women in the room, you can understand why I always think I need one more pair of black shoes. There's, I'm always just one short of the exact number I need. <laughs> and I think if I could just get that next one, it's all going to be good, you know. And uh, and that's, you know, there are regular normal people that are not alcoholics and addicts who think that too. But, you know, they don't act like I do about certain things. So I have to watch that, and I have to say, you know what, I can get another pair of black shoes, but i got to throw one out. I'm not going to be living in a sea of black shoes, you know, so I, got, I put boundaries around it. And um, I was thinking today about uh, a year ago, I was sitting with um, a guy that I used to work with, and you know, we were at work, and he was across the desk from me, and I said, you know, Joe, I have a real problem. And he looked at me and he said, what? What's up? And I said, 
pistachio nuts. And of course he laughed because he's not an alcoholic, right? <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I think it's getting to be a problem for me. And he said, well, they are really good. I mean, they're known for being addictive, you know. And I said, so my thumbnails are bleeding. You see, regular people that are addicted to, to pistachio nuts stop when their thumbs start bleeding. <laughs> I stopped. I stopped the day after. You know, I really did. <laughs> but I did notice that I got to that point where my thumbs were bleeding. And it's funny because um, what I've noticed in sobriety is um, we drink, we drug, we, we pistachios, whatever, until the consequences are greater than what you know the benefit we're receiving or the supposed benefit we're receiving from the, the substance and you know so the day that I noticed my thumb bleeding I said you know what those pistachios are not that good <laughs> you know and I stopped but sometimes alcoholics when it's alcohol you know it's like we tell ourselves that the benefit is so great even long after it's not being great and you know and we keep doing it even though consequences are obviously piling up and we keep like not looking at the consequences or or else disassociating them from the alcohol. And you know, um and I was famous for doing that and uh you know there were there were many things and you know last week I, I, I told some horrific stories I know about some places where I got. But one thing that I was starting to notice when I reached my bottom and became willing to get help was I started to notice people were dying around me. You know, I started to notice that, you know, first there was one guy I knew that overdosed. And then there was another guy I knew that had a, you know, drunk car accident. And then there was another guy I knew that had a heart attack that was like 20 years old. And then, you know, one guy, you know, left my house. He was going to supposed to pick up drugs at 6 in the morning and you know, next day the cops are on my house telling me he's in a dumpster that he died, you know. And I thought, these are not my consequences. Like, I thought, this is all about the other person. They did something screwed up. And I disassociated it from myself. And it was really only after I got a little time away from drugs and alcohol that I started to see that I was there in that picture with those people. You know, and for whatever reason, you know, we were all in this circle of friends and we were all doing similar things. And for whatever reason, people were starting to drop off. And, you know, that that scared me only because I was sober. Because when I was drinking, I didn't, I wasn't scared of dying. You know, I was scared of living. You know, I remember, you know, um, when I first got sober, I, I finally, you know, I finally agreed that alcohol was my problem. And, you know, it took me, it took me, you know, a few days of, you know, drying out to realize that alcohol was my problem. And it took me probably two years into the program to realize that alcohol was my solution and that I was my problem. And alcohol was really what made me able to react to life you know, to, to deal with what was being dealt me. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of times in this program about um, life on life's terms, you know, dealing with life on life's terms. But that sounds hard. That doesn't sound like fun. You know what? That's what I was doing when I was drinking. I was dealing with life on life's terms. You know, you gave me life, and I drank. And then more life came at me, and I drank. And then I started to fight back at life. You know, it was only in this program that I started to find out that life is fine <laughs> and that I don't have to deal with life. I have to, like, experience it. <laughs> and that was um, that was an incredible joy to me. And a lot of that came from, well, it, it all came from step three. And I was real glad to hear, you know, Kevin's talk this, this evening on um, for his 10 minutes because he talked a lot about it. Step three, and I think step three is, you know, it's an incredible step. It's the freedom step. It's the step that allows me to step into life and let it take me. 
And, you know, that was, um, that was incredible to me. You know, I, um, I never, I never experienced life like that. I was brought up, and I, you know, I went through this a little bit last week. I was brought up in a family of very self-sufficient, independent people. You know, my mother was a bit of a feminist back in the day, the 60s and stuff, and, you know, a peace activist and all that. And, you know, basically, she raised me and she raised my sister really as people who could take care of themselves who could deal with life on life's terms, right? <laughs> That's how I was raised, you know. Life gives you something, you give it back, you know. You're dealing with life. That's what I was taught was, you know, you know, you get a punch, you give a punch, you know. You get knocked down, you get up again, you know. I was never taught to let go and see where life is going to take me. And that was completely different for me um, when I came in um, a little while to AA and finally found myself at the group that became my home group, which was in Sea Caucus. And um, I was just chatting with Ron outside because uh, when, I, when I chose that group for my home group, I lived in Staten Island still. And I found myself at that group and I heard things that I had never heard before about working with steps and about saving my life and about reaching out and helping others. And when I when I heard those things, I felt like I finally had come home. And I remember the first meeting I went to there, um, my parents dropped me off. It was an 8 o'clock meeting. And they said, what time should we come back? And I said, 9.15, because that will give me a few minutes to talk to people after. And Sure enough, my parents were the early people, and they showed up at 9.05, and I could hear their car outside idling, you know, because, you know, I still had my keen sense of hearing at a mere, you know, three or four months. So uh, I um, heard the car outside idling, and 9 o'clock passed, and it was 8 o'clock meeting, 9 o'clock passed, and, you know, nobody's getting up and holding hands and saying a prayer, and everybody's just sitting there, and they keep on talking. And they went, they had, a format was they went around the room. It was... Um, it wasn't a circle, it was actually a long table. But they went around the room and everybody got a chance in a row to share on the topic, which was um, the big book. It was a Friday night big book meeting. And um, so there were, people were sharing and I thought, looks like about, it was a big meeting, maybe 50, 60 people, and it looked like about another 10 people to go. We weren't stopping. So I went outside and I said to my parents, I don't know, should I leave? And he said, what do you think? Do you want to leave? And I said, no. All I want to do is sit there and hear these people. And I never felt like that in a meeting before. And um, maybe there were great meetings. There actually was a good big book meeting in Staten Island. But I wasn't ready to hear the message. You know, and that night I was ready to hear it. And, God, I remember it was about to be, you know, 9.15 and still they're sharing. And by 9.30... There was one person left to share, and this woman um, by the name of Diana, and I love Diana very much, but Diana likes to share for 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, uh, she's a very lovely lady and a very wonderful, wonderful person and a great role model to a lot of people in AA. But... I just didn't get how she could start sharing an hour and a half into the meeting and go for 20 minutes. <laughs> and I walked out of that meeting, and it was almost two hours. And I thought, I don't believe I just sat there for two hours. That was my first thought. And my next thought was, wow, like, there's something going on there, you know. And I said to my parents, would it be okay if I came every Friday night? And they said, sure, you know, and so I, I was actually newlywed at the time and I used to take, uh, the bus from the city, because I work in the city, I would take the bus to Sea Caucus, walk to the meeting, and then my parents would pick me up after and I'd sleep over their house. They lived up near there. And, um, next day my new husband would come pick me up, up in Sea Caucus. And it never even occurred to me that that was an odd thing for a newlywed to do, choose to have a night away from your brand new husband, because I felt like I finally had come home. And it's an incredible feeling, you know, and it's a feeling of 
trusting in the process. It's a feeling of hope. It's like, I'm going to be okay. And I can't explain why I felt it. I didn't have that many real details in common with a lot of people there. Um, they were an open meeting, as this one is, and um, they felt actually uh, very strongly that any substance could be a problem for people with addictive personalities. And they had people in that group not only were drug addicts, even not alcoholics, but they had food addicts and all kinds of, you know, debt people and, you know, people in debt and all kinds of, like, you know, every different kind of person in there. And codependents, they had, like, all of that stuff. And the thing that all these people had in common was nothing to do with their substance of choice. It was 100% to do with they all wanted to seek a common solution. And that's why I felt at home there because I was finally able to put aside the stuff I did when I was an active alcoholic to start working on grabbing a hold of my future and grabbing a hold of my destiny. And, you know, that's really, that's what I found out. You know, last week I shared that, you know, I found out there that the time of my death was changed. You know, and, and, I, and I knew that there, was, that there was something real behind that. And, and I said, you know what, I want to work on a solution too. Tell me what do I have to do. And so they gave me all the books and they said read a step a day. And so I started to do that and um, called my sponsor. I was not great at calling the sponsor, but um, I called other alcoholics and, um, and I started to get better. And so, you know, the, the thing is that for me, step three is like an exercise in changing my mind. So where I used to deal with life like it was a challenge that I had to meet, I had to change my mind and say, life is life. I'm the challenge. Maybe I need to put myself to the side and experience life the way life is. And I started to, you know, do things differently. But at first, I didn't understand the deal about changing your mind. And um, I asked a lot of questions about it. You know, how do you do everything the opposite of the way you used to do? And people explained to me all these things. In the book, it, in the big book, it talks about spiritual experiences. It says huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. And it, and it talks about the ideas, emotions, and attitudes which used to be the guiding forces of these men are cast aside and a completely new set of motives and ideas come to dominate them, right? And so it was like, I read that and I said, how do you do that? How do you take everything that you know and believe in and not just throw it out the window, but turn it upside down? Do the opposite. And it was, um, it's funny how, um, how God works. Um, I started to watch TV in early sobriety. I hadn't really watched TV the last number of years um, of active alcoholism because I was very, very busy. <laughs> I was very busy and uh, truthfully couldn't focus on anything like a TV set. And uh, so I started to watch TV and... One of one of the shows that I enjoyed in early sobriety was a show called the John Larroquette Show that some of you may remember. And it was a show about a guy trying to get sober, working in a bus terminal. And it was a real funny show, and, and, he, and they showed him going to meetings. This was one of the early shows that they showed people going to meetings. Now they show that all the time. And uh, I love that David Crosby was his sponsor, you know. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, that hasn't all worked out that well for David Crosby, but... Um, but, you know, I, um, another show that I discovered in early sobriety was Seinfeld. And it was, you know, well past its prime. You know, it was in its mid to later years. But it was still on in primetime TV. And I discovered Seinfeld. And I watched an episode one night where, and you guys all know it's a very famous episode, George is in the, the little luncheonette where they all eat, and he decides 
that since everything he ever did his whole life made him the loser he is, what he really should do is the opposite of everything he thinks is right. And the first thing he does, he orders chicken salad instead of tuna, and then he goes up and talks to a woman that he never met before, which he would never do before. And he does all these opposite things. And sure enough, by the end of the episode, you know, he's dating this beautiful girl who knows George Steinbrenner, and, you know, by the end of that season, of course, he's working for the Yankees, which is his dream job. And I said, that's what they mean. <laughs> they mean if you feel like ordering tuna, you order chicken. And it, it means all the little things, because all day we make choices in our life, right? Every day I make little choices. Do I go here? Do I go there? Do I take this shortcut? Do I go that way, right? Every day of my life, I make choices. And it's all about making different choices for all those little things. And if, and if I work on the little things, the bigger ones will come easier. And so it's all about, like, these little things. And so, um, so I started to make different choices. And, um, you know, one of the things for me was I used to always be the designated driver. Now, you might find that funny, me standing here after everything I told you last week. <laughs> Every thought I, everybody thought I drove just fine. <laughs> and I used to actually shuttle people back and forth between the bar that closed at 2 and the one that closed at 4, because other people would say, I can't drive, I'm too drunk. Beth, can you drive me? And I literally would shuttle people back and forth. And, um, and I was the organizer. Like, people would all call me and say, where are we going today? Well, you know, I'd say there's a really good band playing at this bar or, you know what, it's dark night at that bar or, you know, let's go to this beach or something. And, you know, all of a sudden it would take off and I would organize. And so in sobriety, I started to notice that that was happening too. I started to notice, like, I went to this Friday night big book group every week. And afterwards, we, we would say, oh, anybody want to go to the diner? How about a movie, Right. And I noticed that if I said, yeah, you know what, let's go to a movie, and someone would take out a newspaper, and I'd say, wow, I'd really like to see this, and it's playing in 15 minutes, you know, everybody want to go. And all of a sudden, there'd be all these people going. But I noticed when I started to say, you know, why don't you guys decide what you're going to do, and if I feel like going to that movie you're going to, I'll let you know. All of a sudden, nobody's going to movies. <laughs> And so I, I kind of felt bad about that because I said everybody was at a great time at the movies. But then I thought, you know, maybe just like it's my turn to stop organizing and it's other people's turn to start organizing, right? Maybe I can let that happen naturally. And so, you know, it, it was like little things like that. So it's little things, you know, where I just thought, let me try something different. And... I would walk at, because what would happen was I would pick a certain movie. Okay, here's what would happen. When I would pick a certain movie, I'd say, I'd like to see, you know, this movie. Three people would say, oh, that's a great movie. I want to go see that too. And two people would say, I already saw it. So now I'm stuck. I'm the organizer. Now I've got to choose between the ones who said they really want to go with me and the ones who said they already saw it. And, you know, the people that say, oh, well, I didn't have have dinner. I'd really rather go to the diner. And now it's all me. Now I'm, like, controlling. So I had to put that to the side and say, you know what? Everybody's going to decide for themselves. And I pick where I feel like going. Sometimes I went nowhere. Went home and went to sleep. You know, and I started to notice I felt better about myself. I didn't feel like I had to be responsible for everybody in the world. You know? And so, you know, why would I do that, right? Well, it's not really about the movie. But it's about I knew I needed to be different from what I was before. Because people said to me, the same best that walked down those church steps three months ago will always end up drunk or high. So I got to end up at some point being a different best walking down those steps if I don't want to end up drunk or high. I got to do something to change. And I can't change my inner core, right? My inner core is the same. I can change some of my behaviors. I can change some of my thoughts. And why would I want to change my behaviors and thoughts? Well, because they got me in trouble, right? (laughs) Because they made my life a mess. Because it says in the book, all my scorecards read zero, right? 
I was a nothing. So why not change? You know, it was just like George in the Seinfeld. Why not change? I was a loser. Everything that I did up until that point I thought was totally right got me nothing but a seat in one of those chairs. I had this penny list, I owed plenty of money, people were mad at me, my family, you know. I mean, I had nothing. Why not change? You know, and um, I don't know, some years later I was talking in a rehab um, that I go to pretty often, and I was talking to the women there about changing your mind. You know, and, and I said, you know, we only change our mind when we're changing it for something better. And I like to look at, I, I work in an office in, uh, in the city. Um, I've been doing various types of office work for a lot of years. And when I first started working in an office, we used to, um, we didn't have computers. <laughs> Not like any computers you guys know today. <laughs> and uh, we had, uh, we used to type up a lot of stuff on typewriters. And they were these little typewriters, and some of you are too young to know about these, but they had these little metal bars that held the, the letter on the end of them. When you press the button, the thing would come jumping out and fly out at the paper, you know. And uh, if you typed too fast, what would happen was they'd all get jammed up together and be a big, sweaty mess, you know, and you could, it was terrible. And then, you know, when you made a mistake, they used to, they had this stuff, they called correcting tape. It was like this white tape and you rubbed your pencil eraser on it. And God knows, it never really took out the mistake. <laughs> it never did. And so every time you typed something, you customarily would have to type it two, three times before you got something that was anywhere presentable, right? And then they came out with the IBM Selectric typewriters with the little ball. And all of a sudden, you could type fast. I'm not a fast typist, don't get me wrong. But um, every once in a while I get on a little roll, you know, where I type one word fast, you know. <laughs> I didn't like it when that would happen and my things would all tangle up. So now I got this little ball, and I had no problem giving up that old typewriter. No problem. And then when they put the correct tape right in with the ball, I was a happy, happy camper, and I had no problem giving up that little tape with the pencil eraser. No problem changing my mind, you know, and, and time wears on, and, you know, and, and I work in banking, and I work with a lot of numbers, and I remember, you know, we used to have this giant ledger paper with columns and rows, and every month we used to have to manually accrue all the interest and everything, and we would write it in pencil. We would type it, do it in a calculator. Well, I worked for a Japanese bank, and there were other people that used the abacus, but I wasn't that advanced. I used a calculator, and when, um, and then we would write the number in pencil. But let me tell you, you could spend four hours getting those columns and rows to all put up, because you know you write one number wrong, you'd never find it. You just and the, and eventually, you know, you're erasing your pencil marks so much, there's a hole in the paper. It's horrendous. And they came up with computers, and you know spreadsheets and stuff. You know what? I had no problem giving up that ledger paper. I didn't even hesitate one minute. Give me that computer. You know, and now, of course, you know, you guys are all spoiled young people, right? You get, you go on Word and you type your thing and you hit spell check and grammar check and, you know, I hate to tell you, spell check and grammar check doesn't really save your butt. You got to read it yourself, you know. I caught a... Uh, <laughs> I caught something the other day. I, I work for a large company, and I get something called the daily quality quote. There's like a quality officer, people whose job is just to think about quality all day. And they send us an email every day, a quality quote. And she sent an email the other day. It was quoting someone very, very high up in the company who's considered, they call these Six Sigma champions of quality. Like these people are award-winning quality people, nationwide, you know, known. And she misspelled a word. And she wrote the word exacted instead of exalted. But the context clearly didn't call for the word exacted. And I wrote back to her, and, I, and you know, thousands and thousands of people get this email every day. It's the quality quote. And it was about striving for excellence. And it was about doing it right the first time. <laughs> so I wrote back to her, um, 
I think you meant to write, speaking of striving for excellence, I think you meant to write exalted instead of exacted. <laughs> and, uh, you know, her, her answer back to me was one word. Damn. <laughs> you know, it's like 20,000 people on his email chain. <laughs> She didn't even bother to send it. You know, she didn't even bother to send um, a correction out because so many people are so used to spell check and grammar check that they under, they figure if spell check and grammar check didn't catch it, it doesn't exist. So anyway, um, the point is that we never mind giving up what's not working for what is working. And so I was at the point in my life where things were clearly not working. So... I was open, I was willing, like they say in the, you know, in the third step. And so I made a decision. And, uh, and when I, and when I made the decision, you know, to, um, give up my life and, and, you know, my will to the care of my creator, I did it with, let's say, reluctance or trepidation, because <laughs> I didn't know what was going to be on the other side. I just knew what I was doing wasn't working, and what I was being suggested to do was working for other people, you know, but um, but I knew that what I had, which was self-sufficiency, was no longer working properly, and I was told that that relying on an outside power the group, anybody but me, you know, is better than relying on me. I was specifically told that my mind was a bad neighborhood and that I, I should never go there unsupervised. <laughs> and I remember that, you know, always. And so I said, well, what do I have to do to, you know, do the third step? And, you know, it really tells me in the prayer. You know, it tells me, um, it, it says, build with me and do with me as thou wilt. And I love that because, you know, it's just a pretty way of saying, let me be of maximum service. Find me something to do in my day today to be of service. And it's not just to be of service to AA or alcoholics, to serve the community that I live in. Right? Because all of a sudden, like I said, I'm, now I found myself living in the world. And all of a, a sudden, I found myself not fighting life, but trying to live with it. And so, um, so I want to, I want to give back. You know, it, it, it really is the community, the world that's holding me. And, you know, I can say it's God, it's a higher power, but you know, I live in this earth with a lot of people. And I'm only here because all of them are forming a tight net around me, keeping me up, you know. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of good when I can give back, you know, when I do something good for the community. I love doing, you know, uh, community type work. You know, I work in a couple of, um, peace groups and, uh, and I do, I do a couple of volunteer projects in the schools in the city, cleaning up and stuff. And I love doing that. You know, that's a way for me to give back to the community that somehow lets me live in it, you know, despite all the things that I did, you know, not to deserve it. And and so, you know, I say it's a good thing that life is not fair. Because if life was fair, I wouldn't be living this good life, you know. It's a good thing that I get so much more out of life than what I gave to it. And so right now, you know, I'm trying to kind of balance it out a little better, give a little extra to make up for that fact, you know. Um, so it tells me that. And then it, I love the, the part also, relieve me of the bondage of self. See, because to me the third step is the freedom step. You know, when I went to rehab, they told me a lot about people, places, and things. Stay away from them danger, right? Well, you know, what does that mean? So, you know, me being the intellectual, right, I had to break that down. Well, what does that mean? You know, 
does that mean I can't go to like abandoned buildings where people are smoking crack? Well, that's pretty obvious, right? Does it mean that I can't go to restaurants where they're serving alcohol? Does it mean, you know, I can't pass a billboard where there's a beer sign? You know, what does it mean? You know, never talk to the people that drink? All right. See, I got, see, and then I found out from one of my very wise friends in this program that not only do I have to still talk to people who drink sometimes, but it's actually a requirement because my primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. See, I can't do that if everybody I know is already sober. <laughs> So, you know, now i got to talk to people that drink. <laughs> it's actually a requirement. <laughs> so, um, so I had to find out what to deal with the people, places, and things. And, I, and, you know, they told me the rehab under no conditions. No parties where there's alcohol, you know, no parties where there's people who you used to drink with. No, you know, you can't go to Thanksgiving with your family if they drink wine. You know, the whole, like, they gave me the list, you know, of all the many things I couldn't do. And I thought, I might as well be dead, right? <laughs> I'll never go anywhere. I'll never do anything. I'll just die, you know. And what they didn't tell me was, that's how I have to act until I've got the third step. Because when I have the third step, I can go any place that I'm supposed to be at. Because I'm supposed to be there. So I have to go there, you know. And... And and how do I know it? Because I'm put there, you know. And it's kind of circular, right? Because I'm there, because I need to be there. And I need to be there because I'm there. But, you know, the thing was that I wanted to be free. Like when I ended up at the Sea Caucus group, I saw people laughing and having parties and being around other people and going to places and enjoying themselves. And some of them worked in restaurants that served liquor. And some of them, you know, and they did all these things and they didn't drink. And I said, what do you have to do? And they said, you have to work the steps. And they, and they said, you have to read the book. You have to reach out to other alcoholics. So, um, so I did it because I needed to. And one of the things that um, I was, well, they told, they told me that you have to go out on commitment. And uh, that's a rule for that group. If you have 90 days, you have to go out on speaking commitment. And if you don't have 90 days, you have to go out for support of other people. So, and they don't get around, and they do, and they, that group used to do a lot of rehab, still does a lot of rehab and detox commitment. And so um, I ended up, and you'll have to read the District 34 newsletter to find the details, but I ended up um, <laughs> at a commitment in Sea Caucus for a place called Turning Point, and um, was reading the big book with, with the clients there every week. And I, I noticed a funny thing. I noticed that every time I started my Saturday, I went Friday night to my big book meeting. Saturday morning I woke up and I went to this rehab and I read the book and discussed it with the clients there. And I noticed that the whole rest of the weekend went like a dream. Like everything was exactly perfectly timed and perfectly placed. And I didn't notice it at first. Actually, what made me notice it was um, one particular day uh, when that happened, and I was talking in the rehab, and I was telling the women there, you know, that were leaving that weekend to make sure that they had a ride home, and if they didn't, I would drive them home. That you never supposed to take mass transit home from a rehab, all this danger. And they all swore to me that they had rides home. And sure enough, a couple of really nice things happened to me during the day. I went food shopping and people were nice to me in the store and all that. And then later that evening I was coming back to Sea Caucus to meet some friends for dinner before the meeting and before the Saturday night meeting and I passed them by the rehab and there's this girl sitting at the bus stop outside the rehab. And I saw my car and I go, what are you doing? Waiting for the bus. Did I tell you not to take the bus? Well, yeah, but my ride fell through. I told you to call me. Oh, well, I didn't get to call you. Okay, here I am. Get in my car. And she got in my car, and I said to her, where do you live? Because she lived in Irvington. I live like 10 blocks from Irvington, you know. And so I said, well, that's going to be convenient for me. 
So then, do you need to really go home right now? And she says, no. I said, well, hang out with me. We'll have dinner. We'll go out to a meeting. We'll go out to a movie. Whatever. I organize a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes I fall back into my evil ways. So, uh, so we did that. And um, we didn't end up going to the movie. We ended up going to the diner because you know, more people want to go. And I thought that would be good for her as a newcomer, you know, to sit and smoke and, you know, have cheesecake with everybody. And, uh, you know, that's what we do. And so, uh, and we were driving out of the diner parking lot, and all of a sudden there was a car accident right in front of us. And, you know, so we stopped to see if the people needed help, because it looked like this one girl, the one driver, was maybe in some trouble. And she gets out of the car. That's this girl I know from the program. And she was in Rutherford, and she was just passing through and had a car accident. And the other person was trying to claim that she did the act, you know, she was the damaging person. And, you know, unbelievably there was I and this other girl there to be the witnesses and to sign the police statement that, you know, she was totally, like, blindsided. And I got home that night, and I thought, after I dropped the girl in Irvington, 10 blocks from my house, and I thought, how'd that happen? It was like, yeah, it was like one of those twilight books. And then I thought back of all the things that had been happening to me on a weekend. And I realized that every time I started my weekend thinking about other people instead of thinking about me, I ended up every time being in the right place at the right time. And once I realized it, then I started to notice it every week. And then I thought, this is very cool, right? <laughs> Because you just, you know, you waste an hour and a half of your time reading a book with some girls, and then everything works out perfectly. And not everything, of course. You know, I didn't get rich or, you know, whatever had, you know, the, the wonders of the world showered on me. But every little thing was starting to fall into place for me. And it was just amazing. And, and that's when I really started to think I could trust. I could trust a God that makes everything come together when you do the right thing. That's something I could trust. And I thought, what do I have to do? So now things are going well for me for this first couple of years in sobriety, and, you know, little by little, things are getting better. I'm getting less, you know, less debt. and I wasn't getting out of debt, but less debt, and, you know, a little better in my personal life and starting to make friends and starting to work the program. And uh, and I started to think, third step is cool, you know. And I, I did a fourth step and everything. But then, you know, life has its way, right? Good things don't always happen to good people. Sometimes bad things happen. And so a bad thing happened to me. And it was interesting how it happened. I mean, it's kind of a very personal story, but... Since you guys are hearing every personal detail of my life, I'm not just like. <laughs> so I was in the I was in the rehab this one time, and I was pregnant, and uh, I was working with the women, and I started to feel pain, and I didn't know what was happening, but it turns out I was um, miscarrying, and just like always in the right place at the right time, that's a horrible, horrible thing, and I was like middle term, so it was a very, very painful situation. But it's funny because that, the night before I had had a fight with my husband who was struggling in another 90, 90 and 90 period that he struggled with. And I had said to him, why don't you come with me to the rehab in the morning and talk to this friend of mine that he was in the men's side of the commitment and you know, work with him and read the book with him and that will be really good for you. And he said, no, you know, he's going over to Oaks and he's going to make breakfast because they're having a celebration there. And I said, well, why don't you come to the meeting, come to the meeting. And we had a, not a fight, but, you know, a, a disagreement, a very vocal disagreement. <laughs> and so anyway, there I am, and I don't know it at the moment, but I'm losing the baby. And I start walking down the stairs, and I'm literally holding onto the railing. And I look down the bottom of the stairs. I was just about to fall down the stairs from the pain. And there he is. And I thought, what are you doing here? And he said, nah, I figured you were right. 
that was a miracle in itself that he thought I was right. But <laughs> but that he was there. And we were in Sea Caucus and my doctor was in Manhattan, you know, how about ten minutes away? You know, had we had to come from Maplewood now it's a half hour away. So, you know, somehow I was exactly now you say, Oh, that's terrible, right? But it was awful and I felt awful after the experience and you know, when I came home later that day, I just felt like I wanted to die. I just felt like so awful about all the damage I did to my body over the years. I was starting to feel like all that guilt and shame, you know, that that we feel and you know, um and I got I must have gone out in the backyard and I didn't hear the phone ring. I came back in and there was a message from my my sponsor who had been my early sobriety sponsor but who I hadn't seen in a couple of years. And she left me a message to work. She didn't say, hello, this is Kathy. She, as soon as the deep went, trust God. And I, I came in the room and I sat down and I just cried because I knew she was right. Because I knew everything was happening exactly as it was supposed to happen. And that if I wasn't supposed to have a baby, I wasn't supposed to. And what can I do? Can, am I going to, you know, deal with life on life's terms and get all, you know, because not worry about it. And so, you know, that was um, that was really when I started to learn the depth of where step three took me. You know, and uh, and and finally, um, my my last step three story, and then I'll, I'll go on to it, the meaty stuff is. Um, a number of years ago, I was in my second year of sobriety, I think, and um, I was at a job that was a very horrific, painful job. I, I wouldn't even describe the torture that I went through with this job. But almost immediately when I got there, I started to look for a new job. And oh, I was getting at hundreds of resumes and going on interviews. and You know, it just seemed like every time I got something that I was close on, They'd say to me, oh, it's between you and one other candidate, and then the other candidate got the job. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was like always the bridesmaid thing. And I was so frustrated, and I came home at night crying, and I just felt so alone and so left out. And um, I found myself on my knees one morning praying to get a particular job that I had interviewed, done my fourth interview for like the day before. And I was praying, please give me this job. I need this job so bad. And all of a sudden, I heard myself. And I thought, ah, reliance, not defiance, right? I have to trust that God will give me the job I'm supposed to get. Maybe it's not that one. And I, and I caught myself in the middle, and I changed my prayer, and I said, it could be your will. And... It changed my life that morning. And I went into work and I I just kept saying to myself, Thy will be done, I will be done, I will be done, I will be done. And nothing happened that day. And the next day I got a call from a headhunter. They had a job interview for me at a different place. Went, whatever. Ended up, um, I'm going to details, but it ended up to be the job that I have today. The dream job. See, I was praying for the wrong one. And as soon as I caught myself praying for the wrong one, and I said, just give me the right one, I got the right one. Amazing. And uh, I don't know how that worked, but it worked for me, you know. And, uh, and it was only, you know, um, in October 2001 that I realized, that had I gotten that job I was praying for, I'd have been on like the 85th floor of the Trade Center, Trade Center 1. And I thought, you know, why do I always think I know what's best for me? When I've never known what's best for me, you know, but what I know that's best for me is to keep showing up and accept whatever I'm given. And that's what I know what's best for me. You know, um, the, the other thing about, you know, making a decision is I have to make the decision 
all throughout the day. Like, you, you make a decision. Like, I can say, you know, I decide I'm going to wear yellow tomorrow. You know, big deal, unless I actually pick out something yellow and put it on, right? I keep it on by the time I leave the house, because I often change a couple times in the morning. But, you know, I mean, it, and step three is like that, because I want to take my will back. And I just want to share a little poem that I had um, been given or I had been read in rehab, and I'm, a lot of people probably heard it, but just in case anybody didn't. <laughs> it goes like this. As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. So finally I snatched them back. How can you be so slow? My child, he said, how could I help? You never let them go. So, you know, um, so, so that's what I have to do is all day. I have to keep, you know, putting my toes down. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, and it's all about, you know, it's like, okay, I'm a lion. Okay, I'm still the lion. <laughs> you know, still the lion. <laughs> Cause I want to be defiant, you know, I want to slide back into that all the time. It's my nature. It's my nature. I want to take charge. You know, it's everything I was taught my whole life. I have to keep saying, it's not me, it's not me, it's God. Father, do the work. I have to, I have to do all those things, you know. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's really what, what, what the third step is for me. And, you know, there's also, um, I, there's another book I read called The Course in Miracles. And some of you may have come across it. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. And there's a quote I always like, there's no strain in doing God's will as soon as you recognize that it's also your own. Yeah. Yeah, why am I always fighting? You know, so, uh, so that's it. And, you know, and so, so the, the next thing I got, once I finally got step three, which obviously took a long time, <laughs> um, I got, you know, busy with step four. And I started to write this inventory. And, you know, first I didn't like the word moral inventory. I didn't like that, I didn't like the religion thing. I didn't have a lot of background in that, but I knew what I, what I knew I didn't like. And I didn't like the idea of judgment. You know, well, it's not my fault, it's his fault. And, you know, if you really break it down, you know, he was not that great a person either, you know. And so I, I really had to, to, to kind of walk away from right and wrong and just say, you know, this is what happened. This is the behavior, and this is the behavior of the other person, and, you know, this is the, how I felt about it, and this is how I reacted to it. Because that's how it broke down for me. Um, in the beginning, um, I was, you know, I was in the step Nazi group, so they told me to do the 12 and 12. And so the 12 and 12 has a lot of questions. Uh, especially about, you know, your sex life and it asks, you know, uh, which sex situations have caused you anxiety or bitterness. And I thought, don't they all? <laughs> Do people have sex situations without anxiety and bitterness? Um, I sure didn't. So I, you know, I didn't really even know what to do with that question. But they asked a lot of questions like that. And I did the best I could and I wrote down. I remember I gave it to my sponsor, this woman Kathy at the time, and she said, uh, where's the women in this story? And then I had to go back and redo my whole story and think, well, I don't know women in my life. I have a mother and a sister. I don't even have any brothers, you know, two of a father. But, you know, why are there no women? Why are there no women friends? And I realized how many people I push out of my life. And, you know, I talked a little bit about this last week. And something I struggle with in sobriety is, you know, keeping people in my life that are not physically right in front of me. And, you know, um, recently I, I've actually been going through something because my sponsor moved, you know, three towns away. And we kind of, like, lost contact there for a while. And, you know, I got to the point where I thought, I need to get a different sponsor. And I even asked someone to be my sponsor. And just this last week, I was thinking to myself, 
no, what I need to do is call my sponsor. <laughs> I can't keep choosing a new one. So what, you live three towns away? We all drive, you know. And I really, you know, I have to change the patterns in my life. It's all about change, you know. These steps, these, these work steps, the, you know, the three through nine, it's all about change. And so, you know, that wasn't working really well for me in my life. I never really had friends that knew me to the core because friends went in and out of my life for years, you know. And that's what I really had to find out from my fourth step. And, um, but, you know, I had, I had a lot of problems. In the, in the big book, it says selfishness, self-centeredness. That is the root of all our troubles. And I thought, maybe. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> And, you know, I've only come to find out, you know, even in sobriety, not even in sobriety, especially in sobriety, how selfish I can be, you know. Now that I have all this great stuff and this great life and, you know, how selfish I can be, how I want to keep it, you know. And so I try to turn it to advantage and say, well, I want to keep it and share it too, <laughs> you know. And so, uh, but I had to, I had to really get real about the selfish nature of my of my relationships with other people because that's where I always fail was in my relationships and uh, and that's why I always drank because bottom line was the relationships were unfulfilling I always knew I could count on the bottle and the people were just unreliable for me you know and I had to really look at how unreliable they really were, or was it my expectation, or was I the unreliable one? You know, and I had to I had to go through each one of these people, and that was deep and that was hard, and um, and I had a lot of problems with that. And one of the uh, one of the gifts of the twelve and twelve book is the line where it says we had to drop the word blame. That's been one of the gifts that takes me through every day because I want to blame people every day, all the time. You know, it's just people, places, and things. It's all of their fault. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if I didn't get here on time tonight, it would have been New Jersey Transit Court. You know, that's for sure. <laughs> and, you know, so I, and I still, so I still want to blame. And so I have to... You know, for a while I worked on forgiveness because I was told that I need to experience forgiveness to get peace. And I thought, I just can't do it. And so I worked on acceptance to get me there. You know, I said, well, I can't, I can't forgive that person, but I can accept that they were who they were. And that was my first step toward forgiveness. And then the next step, after accepting that they were who they were, was to stop blaming them for being who they were. And once I could drop the word blame, and I accepted the person, forgiveness didn't even didn't even seem like a hard thing anymore. It was natural because there was nothing left. There was nothing left to forgive because then I I started to see that I didn't have to forgive them. That God already forgave them. Why do I have to do that work? That's an awful lot of work. Why am I judging them? I just have to accept them for who they are, stop blaming them for my life, and let God forgive them. Wow. You know, I could do this. I could really do this. And I started to take responsibility for my life. And, uh, and I did that by, by telling somebody, right? So I read my fourth, I finally read my fourth step as a fifth step. Um, I didn't get, get back with my sponsor to do it because I really felt like urgent need and I couldn't get a hold of her. And I was on a retreat and I, uh, I did my fifth step with, uh, a priest by the name of Father Bernie. And, uh, he was so helpful to me. I grew up, like I said, with no religion of Jewish descent. And so I didn't have that kind of fear of priests, but I basically knew that priests were professional secret keepers. I was pretty sure of that. (laughs) 
that good, bad, or indifferent, they didn't tell anybody's secrets. And this was a priest that was in recovery. And not only was he in recovery for alcoholism and uh, various other things, but he was also a recovering mentally ill person. And he had a very, very wonderful, powerful story that I'll never forget. And he gave me so much hope that if, if he could go from where he had been to where he was, that I could also be healed. And so I told him my fifth step. I asked him, you know, would I be able to do that? And he said, yeah. And I told him. He gave me great guidance on it. And I thought, he did it. And, you know, I felt really good about that. And I moved on to six and seven, you know, like it suggested right away. And, you know, kind of started going out and doing amends. And we'll get into that next week. But um, a number of years later, I started to, because I would always share this in meetings. So I go to a step meeting every week being the step Nazi that I am. And uh, we read the 12 and 12 every week, and it always, uh, when I get to step five, it always says a perfect stranger would be okay, you know. And so I always share how I did it with this priest, who was a perfect stranger you know, when I did it, although I got to know him later. And, um, and it started to get kind of like, like something wasn't feeling right. I notice in this program when you start feeling like something's off, it's because it's off. And so I thought I need to tell my fifth step to my son. Because telling it to a stranger, even though he's not a stranger anymore, but telling it to a professional secret keeper who's actually mentally ill and um, had since, you know, years later retreated into Alzheimer's, and couldn't remember how to tie his shoes, I thought, I might have cheated. <laughs> I might have cheated a little bit. So it was the best I could do at the time when I did it. It really was, and it gave me what I needed to get, and it allowed me to move on to the, the further steps. But I really felt like it was important for me to tell this to a person who knew me and who was going to be ongoing in my life. And I told her my fifth step. And I felt that weight lifting off me that they described in the book. Because I finally felt like I had no secrets. There just weren't any. And what an incredible feeling to let go of that baggage finally. After years in sobriety, you know, to finally know that there's nothing I need to be ashamed of. And... Um, and so that, that's really the, the beautiful gift that I got um, from from this program. You know, I, I, I know I talked a lot about step three, but to me, step three is, well, I think they say it in the book, it's the cornerstone or something. It, it's like a critical, critical part of, you know, working the steps. If I can't trust that I'm being cared for by God, care is actually, for me, the key word in that step. Trust in the care of God. If I can't trust that I'm being cared for, I can't do the rest of the steps. So, you know, it's um, it's been an incredible gift for me, and I and I and I like this. I just picked this up in the back, this third step logo that you guys did, and it says, "God's will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else." What more can you say? Thanks. I'd like to introduce our guest speaker of the month, and it's Beth, and she will be speaking on sets 6, 7, 8, and 9. Hi, everybody. My name is Beth, and I am an alcoholic and addict. And so Jameson noticed I have the big book, the little tiny big book. And it's funny because um, I carry around a whole stack of big books because I do a big book commitment at a rehab on the weekends, so I always carry extras. And this one, I, I give a lot of times to the, the guys in the rehab because this used to be my husband's, and uh, one of his many, many sponsors over the years wrote in this front page, Change or Die. But then Marsha stole the line from me, so... <laughs> Anyway, so change or die. You know, I'm on that um, I'm on that side of the of the fence. 
you know, and uh, and it's funny because one of the, the clients at the rehab that I go to must have been reading from this book once, and they wrote in it, they started to write the 12 steps of alco active alcoholics. One, get money for booze. Two, go to the liquor store and wait for it to open. Three, get booze to go to work. Four, drive while you drink. Oh, no, wait, three. That was four, drive while you drink. And five, tell your boss that you have, and then it ends. So uh, I must have caught him not paying attention until he stopped doing it. <laughs> but, uh, and I don't know, you know, at one point that got added. But, um, you know, and, and, and it's funny because, you know, this has been a long time since I've had a drink in me, you know, I remember the feeling of powerlessness and and the feeling of unmanageability at the very, very, very end. You know, and I touched on that a lot um, the first week I spoke. But even like, you know, like Marsha was talking about she was a partier, and I was a partier too. And for many, many years, I would have said that I don't have any problem with alcohol or any other substance. I would have said I have issues with reality. You know, it's, so, um, you know, in a very real way, I did, you know, and, um, you know, but when I think back, um, you know, I especially had a problem admitting I was alcoholic because I knew if I admitted I was a drug addict, I, I would stop drink, doing drugs. But if I admitted I was an alcoholic, that meant I couldn't drink. And, you know, um, and I really resisted that in the very beginning. And, uh, you know, I remember telling the, uh, rehab people that I drank about a quarter of vodka a week. And of course that was silly. I drank like, you know, gallons a week. <laughs> but my, my thinking was, see, I was awake 22 hours a day because I did coke all day. So if you're awake 22 hours a day, you know, a quarter a day of vodka is not really much of anything. You know, I was just awake so much more. See, you know. <laughs> And I didn't really have a lot of time to eat, so that was really my sustenance. You know? <laughs> and so I really, I had all these, you know, things in my head about it. But, but the fact is, you know, even during the years that I was kind of like a partier, um, I drank abnormally. And that's important for me to remember and to say, you know, I drank vodka was my favorite drink for many years, and I was convinced that the mixers were the problem. It was the things you put in the vodka that got you sick and that got you hung over. So therefore, I didn't enjoy mixers. But I, I knew you have you have to put something in the vodka at least in the beginning of the evening. So I used to have like cranberry juice or Kool Aid, whatever it was. And I all the bartenders I used to have biker bars, they were big giant bartenders, you know. And uh, so I used to get in the habit of just ordering my drinks by color. So I would walk in the bar, and I would say in the beginning of the evening, give me red. And my bartenders knew that that was, you know, what I wanted was, you know, half vodka and half juice. And then I didn't believe in that one shot to, like, you know, whatever. Um, and then, you know, the next bar I'd go into, I'd say, you know, I'm going pretty pink right now, you know. And they would know that's, like, three-quarters vodka and one-quarter, you know, mixer. And then... By the time, you know, the, the wee hours were coming around, you know, I would say to the bartender, um, if I see any color in that drink, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Now, regular people don't obviously order like that. Um, the other thing that was fun, and my bartenders, all, you know, participated in my madness, and they never charged me a dime for any drinks. And um, they participated in it to the point that if I was leaving a bar, I would – of course, never leave half a drink on the bar. And they gave me these giant pink drinks, you know. And I would never want to leave it on the bar, so I would gulp it down really fast so I could get to the next bar or some party or something. And my bartenders, God bless their souls, <laughs> would see me gulp down my drink and and quickly start making me another one. And I'd say, no, i got to go. I'm going to so-and-so's party or, you know, I'm going over this bar to see this band. And they'd look at me and they'd say, but you'll want one to go, right? And they'd make me these giant styrofoam cups to go. Or sometimes they'd give me my glass. And my glasses roll. So 
So, you know, it, it was like, for me, it was like that, you know, drive while you drink. Like, I would not have thought of driving 10 minutes from one bar to another without a giant drink with me. You know, it wouldn't have even occurred to me that there are people who do that, who stop drinking for the 10 minutes that they're driving from one bar to another, much less even people that call taxis, you know. So those people were not people I knew. And so, you know, that was it. But, but the, but the point is that, um, the point is that I did have to change or die. And I didn't know that when I first came in. I really, really thought if I just stopped doing drugs, everything will be okay. And then I kind of, you know, realized that at least for some time I had to stop drinking. You know, I kind of got with that and, and started going to AA meetings and, um, and, and that's kind of, you know, and then I, I, I was presented at this group in Sea Caucus that was um, these deaf Nazis, and uh, they, you know, work work the steps, and they, you know, everybody you ask in that group, you know, what should I do? Read a step a day, call your sponsor, call three other alcoholics. Yeah, you know, they give you this whole list of stuff, and it didn't matter how many people you asked, you got the same answer. So there was like no out. There was no like you could walk away from your sponsor and ask somebody else and get a different answer. You always got the same answer. So I, you know, I kind of knew I had better do it, and I started reading my step every day. And for me, that was really helpful because it was a daily discipline. It was something that if I could do in the morning, I would feel better about myself. You know, um, I started to realize that things were going better for me on the days that I read my step in the morning. And it may be just because I felt better about myself or it may be because the step was having a positive effect on me, you know. And I read the 24-hour book. They said you had to read the 24-hour book every morning, and I hated that book. It was uh, far too spiritual for me at that point in my recovery. And finally, I threw it out my car door one time and said, you know. And it's funny because the thing that made me most angry was um, it was one day when I read about wearing life like a loose garment. And, God. I don't know what was going on with me that day. I was reading it in the morning in my car, parked at the train station before work, and it just made me so mad because, like, whoever wrote that book didn't have my life. They didn't know how complicated my life was, and this was, you know, in sobriety. And I just got so mad. I just threw the book out the window. Next time I was, like, on the road, and I just said, I'm not reading that book ever again. And it's so amazing, you know, that a few years later, I realized that that was what I wanted most in the whole entire world was to wear life like a loose garment, you know. And uh, and I noticed that, you know, that was literally where I was going. That was my, that was part of my um, objective, and I didn't even know it. And it made me so mad. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I started, um, I started to give up my suitcases, you know, to drop them off with the fourth step and, you know, the fifth step and, um, and, and I started to feel a little bit lighter about my past, but still there's me, right? And, uh, you know, like I always like to remind myself, only step one mentions alcohol. The rest of the steps are to address the actual problem, which is me. And so, um, you know, and so it, so it is me and I, and I have to, um, I have to do the work. And, you know, I know in, in this program, a lot of people talk about steps four through nine as the work. Right? People call that the work. They do this, like, quote thing. That's the work. And it's funny because, you know, they, most of the time they say that because of step four and step eight, where you have to get out a pen and a piece of paper. And I don't consider a pen and a piece of paper work. I consider step six and seven work. That's where I have to turn my whole insides, like, twist them around and turn them upside down and completely, like, change myself. But, you know, I found um, <laughs> that's just how I, I see them. And I, and I found that there wasn't a lot of guidance for those two steps in the books. Um, and, and, you know, the books are really where I go to, and the books are my reference point for sponsors. I usually will, you know, I, I go to my sponsor and I say, I don't understand you know, I have this going on in my life. The book says to do this. It doesn't feel right. These are the things I go to my sponsor with. Well, here, I didn't see a lot of guidance in the book. Um, in, uh, 
In the big book, it gives a, a good section on step six. It's about one one uh, sentence, and and it, it pretty much says after you do step five, you know, get on your knees and think about it, and you know, did you do a really good job, and you know, have you missed anything in your first five steps, and you know, and then it says, okay, if you haven't missed anything, then you're willing. So you know, pretty much that, there you go, step six, and uh, and then you go to step seven, which is the next two sentences, you know, and uh, I thought, well, all right, you know, <laughs> that's great, you know, that works for that one minute that I just finished my step five, you know, but I find that step six and step seven require daily action from me, so, um, you know, and, and I guess not everybody looks at it like that, some people look at that as more of a 10 step thing, but for me, every day, I have to be willing, and I have to be humble, and I have to, and I have to keep repeating that. It's like a, a, a little cycle throughout my day. Am I willing? Am I humble? Am I willing? Am I humble? And sometimes I ask myself that question through the day, and I'm like, no, not. You know, <laughs> what happened? An hour ago, I asked myself, and I was fine. <laughs> Where to go? And so, you know, to me, it's a daily activity. Um, the, the step book, the 12 and 12, also. Um, my least favorite chapter is the step six chapter. Um, I dislike it. It talks about the difference between the men and the boys. It's not the sexist language that bothers me, really. It's just that I don't understand that striving for a perfect objective, which is God. Does that mean I'm not perfect? Does that mean everybody's not perfect? Aren't I created in God's image? Aren't I perfect? I don't understand that. And, you know, and is my behavior ever going to be perfect? I don't think, right? I don't think. And so, you know, it very, it confuses me a lot, that chapter. That's, that's not a good chapter for me. Um, there's one section where it talks about patient improvement. I like those two words, patient improvement. And I wrote next to them, take it easy, in my 12 and 12 book, which I do continue to carry every day still and read most every morning. Um, and, and that helps me a little to get focused. It's take it easy. It's do the best you can. If I keep asking myself every hour or two, am I willing, am I humble, am I willing, am I humble, chances are at, by the end of my day, if I look back, I was pretty willing and I was pretty humble, you know. So that's kind of my exercise around it. But um, but these are, you know, here's the way I look at it. I, I heard a, a girl tell a story when I was in early sobriety, and I'm, I'm not a really great storyteller. Um, but it co kind of goes like this, that, you know, it's like, you know that your new furniture, you, that you know that the furniture you have in your living room is just awful. It's broken, it's, you know, beaten, it's stained, it's just not good, it doesn't go with what you want to be. So, you know, you, you talk to some people and they say, you, you know what, if you want to get new furniture, the first thing you got to do is get rid of the old furniture. You say, all right, you know, that makes sense. I'll get rid of my old furniture. So you put your old furniture out in the backyard. And you think about what your new furniture could be. And there you are sitting on the floor of your living room. And there's that old furniture out there in the backyard. And you keep looking at it like, I could just bring in the couch, right? <laughs> I got to sit somewhere, right? Because it's the emptiness is the scariest thing, right? And it's like, you know, and so so for me, step six, step four is when, like, I finally am understanding that my furniture is beaten and battered. And step five is when I'm actually admitting it to another person. Oh, my God, I can't live with this furniture. Step six is when I'm like, okay, I'm willing to put it in the backyard. And step seven is, like, being humble enough to sit in the empty room and leave it there and let my higher power come in with the new furniture because it takes a little time. And, you know, um, I, I also like what Marcia said, how she want to press a button and be happy. See, I want a mainline sobriety. Like, I want it to all, you know, I like it in my vein, right? I want it in my vein. I don't want to mess around. You know, I don't want to have everyday work. What do you mean everyday work? You know, I want it now, and I want the, the best 
sobriety. You know, I want the, the top quality stuff too. And so, you know, um, so for me, you know, the experience of, of the empty room, of not knowing what's going to come in was scary. And, you know, that was something that reading the, the literature helped me with and also the fellowship of AA, it helped me to see, to get a vision for where my life was going. So it gave me hope, and the hope helped me to stay with the willingness and the humility, you know. Um, so, so that's kind of, um, you know, I talked I talk a little bit last week about how, you know, we always are willing to change things that don't work for things that do work. But I'm alcoholic, and I forget. Like, I have that instant forgetter. They say incredibly short memory, right? I have that instant forgetter. I forget that what I have doesn't work. I forget that there's something else that works. I have to keep coming to meetings and keep reading the books and keep listening to other people and keep praying because I have this forgetter. And, you know, my forgetter starts, it doesn't tell me that drinking would be better for me at this point. It tells me that taking charge of everyone's life starts looking right to me. You know, it tells me that, you know, um, being in places I don't need to be is right for me, you know. And so I have to I have to watch all those things, you know. And um, it also, another thing that it tells me is blame is okay. See, my instant forgetter wants me to blame everyone else when things don't go right for me. And um, in the fourth step, one of the most, powerful lines or even phrases in the 12 and 12 book for me was when it said we have to be willing to give up the word blame like not just doesn't say stop blaming people it says take the word out of your vocabulary it just doesn't even exist anymore and I found that since I released myself from the idea of blame I got free from blame and you know and and that's what that's the one that I have to watch the blame thing because after blame comes revenge you know and all that other good stuff right because if it's your fault you know I need to get you back right so I need to um I need to really you know stay with that and drop the word blame just drop it from my vocabulary it didn't exist it didn't exist before. It doesn't exist now. And and that's, you know, that's been a tremendous um, gift for me. Blame is such a, cru- a, a crutch. I've seen so many people, not just myself, but I've seen so many people in this program get freedom from bondage just by dropping the word blame. And, you know, um, I remember one time I, you know, I was, and a meeting and someone was talking about, you know, they're working through all these issues with the therapist and their family and all this stuff. And the guy that was after this other person said, you can save a lot of money. All you got to do is stop blaming. Just stop blaming today. You don't have to go to therapy anymore. And I thought, wow. Now, I don't know if that's true for everybody. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a psychoanalyst. <laughs> um but for me, that is, that's been a tremendous, tremendous freedom is, you know what, I don't have to blame anyone. Blaming other people only pulls me down. And I had to really, really get with that. Um, a, a couple of things, um, a couple of things that, you know, also I was thinking about with humility and with the changing behaviors. Um, last time... I talked a little bit about um, a job search that I had. Um, And I was praying for a certain job because the job I was in was very sick and very hurtful. And I just wanted this other job, and I prayed and I prayed. And finally, I stopped praying for particular jobs, and I just started praying for God to use me the best he could and when he was ready to give me a job, and I got one. And that's a good story. But, you know, it's but but there's not just, you know, there's, Everything in our life is all these multiple layers, right? So, you know, I was at this very sick job, a very dysfunctional job for a year and a half. 
and I um, I knew almost immediately that it was the wrong job. Within a month, I was calling back other places that had given me offers, trying to get those out again. And I was there a year and a half and really felt like, oh, why is God punishing me like this? Like, I finally got sober, you know, I was just sober, you know, a couple of years. And I thought, why is this happening to me? And only afterwards, you know, can you see why you were in a particular place at a particular time. So um, the situation, well, there were many, many situations. One of the situations was I had a boss who was having an affair with a woman who worked for me. They were both married with kids. And unfortunately for me, how this affected me, was while they were locked in his office giggling, let's just say, um, I had to do both of their work, right? So, you know, because he was above me, she was below me. So I had to cover a lot of work. And I was there every night till like 9 o'clock at night, you know, sweating, trying to get all the work done. So it did affect me, you know. But the uh, but the thing was that it became a very big gossip item at the job. And I never was a tremendous gossiper. But it's funny how when you stop drinking, all these new character defects start reaching out to you, right? <laughs> gossip was starting to look pretty good to me at that point, you know. After all, gossip, you know, even though I never really participated in it much, I was around it a lot, you know, in the bars and everything. And so, I, you know, it was something I knew how to do. And, of course, all the gossip was kind of aimed toward including me because I was clearly in the middle of this relationship. So anybody who would gossip would, like, kind of try to pull me in. At first, I started to get pulled in. And every time I would get pulled in, I would go home at night just feeling terrible. Just feeling like, God, if nothing else, that was 10 minutes I stood there and gossiped that I could have been doing work and getting out at 10 to 9 instead of 9, if nothing else. You know, it was clearly wasting my time. And I talked to my sponsor about it, and, you know, she said, you have to not do it. And I said, well, you know, they're all gossiping all around. I mean, it's so obvious that these people are doing she said, they can gossip, but you can't. And I said, oh. And, you know, I really, I talked to a lot of people, and um, I, I got a lot of good, I used to go to a women's group in Maplewood, and I got a lot of good guidance from people there. And um, they told me, you know, you have to say, when they pull you in, you know what, I'm really busy right now. Can't talk about it. Sorry. And walk away. And, oh, the first three, four, five times I did that, it was so hard because they would hear me say it and then they wouldn't hear me say it and they would still continue pulling me in, you know. And then after a while they got used to hearing me say that. And I walked and I walked away from the whole thing and I stopped even being asked to participate in the gossip. And in the very end um, of that, you know, six-month period where, where they were doing this, the, the man got fired, um, and the girl quit the bank, and she came up to me on her last day, and she hugged me, and she said to me, thanks for being such a great friend. I was in front of her, believe me. <laughs> and she, I said to her, I don't understand. And she said, I know that you never said a bad word about me. And she said, you don't know how much that means to me that there was one person whole company that didn't talk badly about me. And I thought, wow. And I, she was crying, and I started crying, and I thought, that's what happens. I didn't do anything good. I just, I just stayed away from the not good, you know. So it was, you know, and it, and it came from, am I willing, am I humble, you know, because I, every time I would talk bad about another person, it was about me being better than that other person, right? So every time I engage in gossip, it's the opposite of humble. It's me, the all-powerful. And you know what? Me, the all-powerful, is going to drink and is going to die, you know? And I have to get with that. And I have to say, you know what? I can't afford to gossip. I can't afford to think I'm better than this woman, 
who's fooling around with a boss? You know, who's to say there's not some point in my future life when that would be happening to me? Okay, I don't think so, but <laughs> I don't think so. But the point is that I can't read the future. I don't know. I don't know. I can't judge anyone because I might be that person, you know. And so, and I really learned that through that, you know. And um, and I learned to control my rage at that job. I used to um, I used to be a uh, a crier. <laughs> When someone would really make me angry, I would yell at them back at work because I'm a perfectionist and I hate not being perfect. And they would yell at me and I would yell back and then they would yell at me and then I would cry and run away. Literally. A grown woman, you know, well, somewhat grown. <laughs> Maybe not completely grown up. But, you know, I, I really had to look at that and I, and I talked it out. You know, actually not with my sponsor, but with some other women. And I said, you know, I don't like myself when I do that. I'm not comfortable with that. What is that all about? I feel like helpless because I'm not winning the argument, and so I cry and run away. That's not good professional behavior. <laughs> and so a couple of the women, and, um, and one of them is here tonight, said to me, well, they gave me very specific instructions, and I don't need to go the, through the instructions, but they gave me very specific instructions. This is what you need to do. You need to walk away, be silent, and walk away for these amount of minutes, and then you need to come back in, and this is what you need to say. And they gave me a script, and I thought, I'll never be able to do that, you know, and and I did it. The, my new boss, the one that replaced the one who was philanthroping or whatever, philandering, right, the new boss was uh, yelling at me in front of the people that worked for me. And that, you know, that's mortifying. And I, you know, I yelled at him back, and then he yelled at me, and then, I, you know, I got that feeling. And I walked away for the amount of minutes they told me to, and then I walked into his office, and I told him what they told me to tell him. And he looked at me, and he said, I understand. Thanks for letting me know. And uh, he never yelled at me again. And I've never since that one day had that feeling or had to even been in that situation. But, you know, so, so the point is that even though I hated this job and I needed to be out of it, I was willing to stay there and I was humble enough to keep my one foot in front of the other. And wait until God's time. And you know what? He didn't get me a job right away, but he lifted a couple of defects from me right away. How great is that? You know? And and he gave me my job in, in you know, not that long. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things um, that happened to me when I stopped blaming other people when I started taking responsibility for my own behavior. And to me, that's what step six and seven is. Taking responsibility for my own behavior, but in a way that I let God direct my thinking, you know. And and that's been really powerful for me. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's... um. I wrote down this little quote here, and I don't know, it just hit me. Uh, yesterday I read it. We either make ourselves miserable or we make ourselves strong. The amount of work is the same. And it's by Carlos Castaneda. And, you know, it was like I was spending so much effort making myself miserable, even in early sobriety, that I had to share it with other people. I had to ask for help. And, you know, my higher power works through other people. And when I ask them for help, he's hearing too. And, you know, they tell me specifically what to do in different situations. And if I'm humble enough and I listen, the character defect gets removed. But, you know, it's still every hour, you know, am I willing, am I humble, am I willing, am I humble? It's still that way because it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't get easier. You know, and, uh, and so, 
So step six and step seven are, for me, very much maintenance steps, even though, you know, that's really like they talk about step 10 through 12 being maintenance steps. But for me, step six and step seven are very much one-time things right after step five, but then it's like the everyday, daily effort to make sure that I'm still, you know, on my beam, that, you know, I have my daily reprieve because my spiritual situation is right. And so that's been my experience. Step eight, on the other hand, um, that's a one-time thing for me. Um, I did a list right after step four, like I was uh, recommended to. Um, I put some people on the list. You know, um, it talks about, in, uh, in the 12 and 12, it talks about our twisted relations with family, friends, and society at large. And, you know, for me, the, those words together, twisted relations, you know, almost like I can feel like a chill in my spine just saying those two words together because I know how twisted my relations were. At the time I had those relations, they all seemed perfectly normal, just like ordering drinks by color seemed perfectly normal at the time, <laughs> you know. And so, but I had twisted relations. And so I had to write a bunch of names down. Now, I, I told you that when I first did my fourth step, I didn't have women on my list. And I went back um, at the recommendation of my sponsor, and I looked at each of the relations I had with women. And I found that they were twisted, too, um, but in a very different way. Um, and, and so I had to put some of them on the list. I put um, – and then I had other, you know, other people that were not on my four-step list, but that as I went through step six and seven and started to get better, I realized needed to be added to my list. Uh, one of the beautiful things about this program, I think, is that steps eight and nine are separated. And, you know, we talk a lot about how steps four and five are separated and how great that is. Steps eight and nine being separate are incredible, you know, for me, because I would never put people on my list if I really would have thought about how I would make amends to them. Um, you know, I shared it a while ago that um, one of my – issues is that I tend to walk away from people. If I don't feel like being with them, I don't like what they're saying, I don't, you know, whatever, they're not doing what I do, I walk away. And truthfully, as the years go on, there's lots of people I walked away from. And I don't really know how to reach out to those people. And I'm not really sure what I'd say to them if I did reach out to them, except, sorry, I walked away from you, <laughs> you know. So I had a lot of things where, like, I felt like there was an amends out there, but I didn't know what it was. But I put the people on my list. I was told by my sponsor, if you're not sure if someone belongs on the list or not, put them on the list. Because there's probably a reason why you're not sure. So I put these people on the list. I started with the real obvious ones. Um, I, I started with um, my boss at the time, you know, that I got sober, the last boss I had. Um, then I went to my, you know, ex-boyfriends. Um, I went to my family, you know, like that. And then I thought, then I'm done. Then I kind of thought, that's a little weird. I don't have anybody that's known me more than, you know, a few years. <laughs> Where's all those people from the early part of my life? And I really had to think about it, and I and I really couldn't. Um, I really couldn't think about it because I couldn't remember a lot of their names. And uh, and it was very strange. One night I, I had a dream, and I, I'm not a big dreamer. I'm the, I dream, but I don't remember my dreams. And I'm, I'm not one of these people that ever wrote down, like, what they remember from their dreams, nothing like that. And this one night, I had this most vivid dream, and I was with three women, and we were at, like, a restaurant. And I don't know, I didn't remember any details from the restaurant, but all I remembered was when I woke up, I knew there was a reason why those three women were sitting at the table together, and it was because I owed them all an amends. And I just wrote their names down really quick before I forgot. And, you know... And so, and that's kind of how it was. And so I wrote people's names down on the list. And as, you know, as years went by, 
first I made the amends to the obvious people. Um, not, not a single one of my amends were simple, and partly that's because of the way I live my life, you know, exiting people from my existence. Uh, my Japanese boss, I had to write him a letter because he had since gone back to Japan, and I had to write him a letter in English telling him, you know, what I did, and what I did really, I didn't have to give him details of, you know, what I was doing, but I had to apologize for the many times I lied to him about why I was late to work, you know, and how I wasted the company's money doing various things. Did I tell him I embezzled money? No, I didn't tell him I embezzled money. Um, I don't think he would have under. I don't think he even understood what I told him. <laughs> Truly, his English wasn't all that good when he was here. But I talked to my sponsor about the em embezzlement thing, and you know, she said it because I had I had actually covered my track very well, and it would have been very very difficult for them to recreate what I had done, and the bank itself would have gotten in a lot of trouble. So she suggested that what I need to do is you know, put controls into place in, in job, current and future jobs to make sure embezzlement isn't so possible like it was for me. So I could be especially vigilant because I knew all the ways. And to this day, you know, people consult me <laughs> in my current bank and ask me, you know, where's my risk? Let me tell you about my process. You tell me where my risk is. And I can do it. I can say, well, let's just say... Let's just say, for instance, you were a less than, you know, honest person. You would be able to, and I can walk them through a process, and I say to them, this is where you need to put your control on. And so that's been, you know, so every one of my, every one of my amends has been very, very um, indirect. Almost all of my amends have been very indirect. Um, I had a... Uh, <laughs> Well, I won't even go into that one. I had I had a friend. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was one of my more dysfunctional relationships. Um, it's not really exciting, but I, it was a guy. I, okay, so there was a guy I went out with from when I was 17 to when I was 29, and he was a big part of my dysfunction in many ways. Although he didn't know me in my last years of very very serious you know trouble. But um, he, uh, but anyway, I, I cheated on him and threw it in his face, and you know, I just wanted out. I I didn't know how to break up. I was a terrible break robber, and so I uh, so I did the thing that I knew would get him angriest. I didn't try to, cover, you know, it was very it was a very dysfunctional thing. It was a dysfunctional breakup, even forget about the relationship. Twelve years, I couldn't know how to break up with the guy, and you know. Um, <laughs> You know, he literally came over my house, and there was some other guys, like, jewelry and stuff all over my bedroom. I mean, and I didn't, you know. Okay, so I needed to make an amends to this guy, not for the fact that I cheated on him, because that was a one-time thing, and that literally was to break up with the guy. But when I met this guy, he was like a very straight-laced, quiet, you know, mind his own business type of guy. He was very anti-drug and everything. He never really, he, he would sip a drink all night, you know, he was like that. And by the time uh, we broke up, he was like living in a log cabin in Pennsylvania and, you know, <laughs> working in a factory on an assembly line and gambling away what Lily made and, you know, I don't know. It was just very, and he didn't have a phone or he, and he didn't have like a real address or anything. And that's literally how I left him. And I thought, that can't be good, right? <laughs> I could not have been good for this guy if if he started out like a regular guy. We went to college together, and that's how we ended up. And so I thought, I, I better make amends to him. And I was really nervous about it. I couldn't get in touch with him, obviously, because he lives in his log cabin in Pennsylvania. And, you know, <laughs> I didn't remember the exact, you know, it's like you turn left at the third rock, and I didn't really remember the exact thing, you know. I also had a tremendous resentment against him, and the reason I had a resentment against him was uh, he owed me some money, and he also had the key to my car. And um, at one point, like a year after we had broken off, I got 
one of those little registered mail cards at home, and it was like I could tell it was his town that it was coming from. And I was all nervous and sweaty. I had to go to the post office and pick it up. I had like three of my drinking buddies come with me because I was so nervous. What if he wants to get back together? You know, maybe it's the money he owes me. Maybe it's my car keys. Why would he send registered mail? And and I swear to God, I opened the envelope. It was just an envelope. I held it up. Nothing in it. Nothing shook. And I opened it up, and it was a copy, like a copy on a copy machine of a cover of a cassette tape. And he circled a song like he wanted me to listen to. But he was too cheap to actually send me the tape. So I had some, I had some big resentments. After 12 years, I had some, I had some, a large one. You know what I mean? And, uh, and he still had my car key and, you know, the money was not forthcoming as you might imagine. And so I, um, I really, I really had to pray a lot on it. And it took me years to even get enough willingness to do this one. And I was out on Long Island at a retreat, and I was doing some work, some step work, and his parents came from Long Island, and um, I remembered their phone number, but I wanted to make sure, and I looked them up in the phone book, and they were still at the same place, and I called them, asked them if there was any way they could reach him, and if, you know, they could tell him, you know, that I'd like to talk to him and give him my phone number. And it was very strange. I, I had to do a script. I went over it with my sponsor, what to say to the parents, you know. And the whole thing got thrown out the window because his mother answered the phone, and when she realized who it was, she said to me, oh, it's so nice to hear from you. And then I said, oh, thanks, you know, hi. And then she said, so can I ask you what happened? I said, what do you mean what happened? Well, I just don't see you anymore. Like, he never told her that we broke up. This is eight years later or something, you know. <laughs> And I, I, didn't, I didn't even know what to say, you know. I mean, all my script went out the window. I was just like, it was just so, such dysfunction. I couldn't even, I could I just re- remembered. It all came back to me, the whole dysfunction of the situation. And I said, you know, I told her, you know, that I'm doing okay and, you know, pretty well. I'm getting my life together. And, you know, um, I just wanted to talk to him and, if you know, they could just give him my phone number. And uh, he didn't call. But I had to count that because it was as far as I could go. <laughs> so that was another one. Another um, indirect one I had to make was, you know, they talk about um, dead people, right, departed people. And there's a lot of different methods people have. You know, you read a letter at the person's grave. You burn something and it goes, the smoke goes up to heaven. I had a friend of mine. Um, he was my best, best friend in high school. And... Um, we were partying buddies. We were everything buddies. We were like soulmates in high school. And I, I walked away from him and hurt him because my new boyfriend, who was the guy I was with for 12 years, didn't like him because, of course, it was, you know, a uh, rivalry with two guys, right? And so I basically really hurt this guy, and there was no reason for it. And I hadn't called him in many. Last year of, like, daily crack smoking. I get a call from my mother. Guess who I talked to today? It was many years later. I said, who? I just talked to Bradley. And I said, you did? Wow, how's he doing? Oh, he's doing fine. You know, he finally came out. He was gay. And I said, well, I thought he might end up being that way, you know. And he was a boyfriend of a guy who my mother knew the parents of. And the thing is, why is this important? The thing is, that I was too screwed up. I like that word Mocha said Marcia used to. She had a good story. I like that ten minutes. She um I was too mocha to realize that what my mother was telling me was important. And she gave me a phone number to reach this guy who I was really, really good friends with, but I was all well, just thinking about my next tie. And I couldn't concentrate. I don't even think I wrote it down. I think I pretended I wrote it down and I didn't write it down. And I I didn't call. And then and I, was, I was newly sober. A year later, I was newly sober, and my mother said to me, not that she talked to this guy, but that she heard from this other parent that he was ill, that he had AIDS. And again, you know, I was sober, but just but a few months, like it said, you know, and I was too fogged out to realize that I was being told something important. And... I didn't say to her, wow, I don't have that phone number. Can you get me that phone number? 
And then when it finally came time, you know, six, seven, eight months later, for me to do this damn eight step, and there he is on my list, so I said to my mother, can you find out if I can get in touch with Bradley? Too late. Okay, great. Now, the first, the year that I got sober was in 1993, and there were a lot of people dying of AIDS back then. 92 to 94 or something was like the years when they were all dying. And it was, um, it was hard for me to deal with that news about my friend, um, because as soon as she told me that he was dead, I realized that twice God had put him in my life. And twice, I forgot to pay attention. And, you know, we're only in this life for a fleeting moment. And it's like, if I'm not paying attention, I'm going to miss chances. And I just felt like, ah. Oh. You know, and what there was in my life that year, a, a guy named Ronnie, and he went to my home group in Sea Caucus, and he was a pretty much raving lunatic. He was... um <laughs> Not only was he recovering from alcohol, he had a couple of, a couple of good sober years, but he um, he was also dying from AIDS. And um, I loved him because he was crazy. I mean, absolutely crazy. He lived most of his life in mental institutions. He I had so many funny stories of speaking commitments I did with him at mental institutions where we would go there and the people would remember him. <laughs> and we would drive in and he'd say, that's the building I stayed in when I, and I jumped out that window to escape, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because it's one of those things, it's like that, that movie Big Fish. Like I just assumed that Ronnie was telling lies all the time because his lies included a lot of famous celebrities and stuff, you know. And, uh, and then we would go on speaking commitments and they were all true, you know. And, uh, it, and, and in the end, um, Ronnie was very delusional and he was difficult to be with because he would say hurtful things and he would make up stuff and he really couldn't figure out up from down. And somehow, you know, I prayed on this and I, I was able to spend some time with him in the end. And I wasn't there the day he died, but I was there um, with him two days before he died. You know, we watched the, a boxing match and, you know, it was like his last Saturday night in this world. And I just knew that when he died, it was like I got to make my little amends to, to Bradley, you know. It was like I could never go back in time and be there for the person that I didn't pay attention to. But I had a chance now to right that wrong, and I did. And so so that was one of my um, one of my good amends. And, and, you know, and some, and some were sillier than that. So one time, uh, you know, one time I was at a, a, a concert in the city. I like to go to rock concerts. And I was at a concert in the city. It was, uh, Jeff Beck in Santana. And I was sober a number of years by this point. And, uh, I went with my husband and two other sober people. And we had the worst seats in the place. <laughs> Literally, we were in, uh, well, it doesn't matter, but we were we were in the back and the top. It was just terrible, and you know, it's so easy. You fall into old behaviors. Next thing I know, I'm in the front row because you know I see people I know and they work for Guitar Magazine, and I'm just like you know I'm in the front row and all my friends are in the back. And I felt a little bit guilty about that for a minute until Jeff Beck started, but <laughs> but anyway. Um, that was that was a divine night for a couple of reasons, and one of them was there was a guy. Well, of course, I met people that I knew there that worked in this guitar magazine, which was very cool. I didn't really owe them any amends, but there was a guy who I saw that was like ten rows back, and as, I, as soon as I saw his face, like a whole memory came back to me of a very very dysfunctional night where this guy was was a key player, and he. And he didn't drink, and he had no idea what was going on. And uh, it was a, a very, very strange and bizarre night in which my car got towed because he parked it in a towaway zone in Manhattan. And, you know, not only did I make him walk up and down Manhattan to the pound and to the ATM machine and everything, but, of course, I made him pay. 
because, you know, he did that. Now, he did, in fact, park my car in the television zone. <laughs> and he, in fact, was the only person not completely wasted from five days straight of drinking. But I really had to, as soon as I saw his face, it came back to me that he was in my insanity. Like, for one night, he was living in my insane world, my upside-down world, where people drive into the city at 6 in the morning to stand on the line and get MTV tickets for some show, like some crazy show in the future, and get towed away. Like, he lived in my upside-down world, and we were drinking beers for breakfast and, you know, all that. And I realized, as soon as I saw his face, that, he should not have had to pay for my car. And so I walked up to him and I gave him the money. And he was like, you know, why are you giving me the money? See, because I was so good at manipulating people into my dysfunction that he was happy to be in my dysfunction. He was literally happy to be with me and this other girl who had been drunk for five days, who were still drinking in the city at 6 o'clock in the morning, and had this guy standing on line to get these MTV tickets and then made him walk up and down the city for the ATM machine because we didn't even have pocketbooks. And, you know, he actually felt privileged to be part of that. <laughs> and I said, no, you know, you were abused. You don't even know, but you were abused. And I really am sorry that, you know, that was the way I lived my life. I, I took hostages. And, you know, he was one. And God, you know, there might be other ones out there I don't even know until I see their face, you know. That's the shame of it is that there are people out there, you know, that I took hostages. And uh, there was um, one more thing I'll say is my parents. So when I first came into the program and I did my fourth step, I made amends to my parents. You know, I said, I really want to sit down and talk to you. I'm really sorry. Like, I abused your goodwill. You know, you bailed me out of many, many financial messes. Um, you know, I lied to you many times on Sundays when I was invited to dinner and said I didn't feel good. You know, it was really that I was, I felt very good. You know, I was very high. <laughs> and the few times that I went there, you know, I spent the whole time on the phone making plans, you know, arranging deals. You know, it was it was a very abusive way for me to treat my parents. And so I apologized to them. And they, you know, of course, good Jewish parents, and they said, no, 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 we're just glad you're okay now, you know. And so I got away with that amend for a long time. And, but, see, I go to a step meeting every week. And so every whatever, it's not really 12 weeks, every, like, 16 or so weeks, because we do a tradition too, every, like, 16 or so weeks we come to step nine. And I started to think when people were talking, I never actually did pay them back the money. You know, and I kind of offered it to them a couple times, and then they said to me, you know, no, 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 we want you to do well, you know, the money's gone, don't worry about it. But, you know, as every 16 weeks, it's coming up, step nine, you know, and it started to be like, you know, I'd raise my hand and I'd say, okay, I still haven't paid my parents, you know. And so um, I thought, when am I going to be free of this? Well, of course, because then I start paying them, right? Now they're retired, and they're living on a fixed income, and they sure could use my money at this point in their life. Maybe this is God's way of having me help them. Because tell you the truth, they made some bad stock market decisions. It's good that I didn't pay them before. <laughs> but anyway, now they could really use the money. And so um, at one meeting I was at, you know, not long ago, four or five months ago, and I said, that was more like six or seven months ago. I said, I'm telling you that when I come back and do this step next time, I'm going to be able to say to you that I'm on a payment plan with my parents. And, yeah, I guess it must have been like nine months ago because like seven or eight months ago, I called my mother and I said, I'm going to start sending you a check a month. And she said, oh, no, honey, I don't want you to do that. I'm just happy that you're doing okay now, right? And I said, no, you don't understand. I will not do okay if you don't take this money. And they said, well, we don't want, you know, you to suffer. You're going to go in debt because of this. And I said, you know what? 
That's not the issue right now. Right now, I cannot live unless I pay this money to you. And, well, if you insist, we'll take it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so that's begun the payment plan. And uh, it's been a little erratic. Some months I give them more and some months I give them less. But I pretty much stick to it. And, you know, today I can go to a ninth step meeting and say, I'm good with my parents. You know, and I feel, and I didn't pay them back all the money yet, and I don't even know if they'll live long enough for me to pay back all the money I ever borrowed from them. But, you know, <laughs> but the fact is I'm going to try. I really am, and I hope they do live long lives. You know, they deserve it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, once, once a year I like to go to one of the step studies, one of the back to basics, or another kind of step study, intensive step study and see if I've missed anything. And, um, you know, some years I go when I haven't, and some years I go when I haven't. And last year, um, I had a big one. And, uh, and it was, it was kind of a crazy one. And, you know, I'll, I'll say it now because once you let it go once, you can let it go another time. And, you know, I actually, I was, um, I noticed last year that I was resentful of, of my husband for leaving me. And that doesn't sound crazy until you realize that he died. And I was actually resenting him for abandoning me. And I thought, that's not right. I can't do that. And, you know, I tried, I went to the grave, and I did, you know, I'm sorry. I, I know that you didn't abandon me. I realized that you died. And... I don't know, it didn't feel right. And I literally, I had to pray it every night for a long time and write it every night for a long time. And finally, I, I got released from it after, I don't know, a few months of trying, you know, and I didn't resent it anymore. And and so, so I guess that's my ninth step story is not a single one of mine has just been like walking up to the person and saying, I'm sorry, you know. Whatever. Every single one I had to really think about and I had to, I had to work it as well as I was willing to work it. And in God's time. And, uh, and I'm happy to say that this year I did my step study and I couldn't find any. I'm, I'm resent free. So, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for the month of July, and that is Beth, and she'll be speaking on sets 10, 11, and 12. Hi, everybody. My name is my name is Beth, and I am an addict and alcoholic. Is that good, Mike? That's good, right? Okay. So, um, I'm short addict and alcoholic. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'm really glad to be here. Um, this has been a, a really good experience for me. Um, you know, it all comes down to me, right? Um, because, you know, it's kind of been a chance for me to think about, you know, where I've come from, what I've been going through, and where, where I'm headed, really. You know, and I guess, um, that's, uh, that's kind of, a, uh, you know, my definition of humility is really like knowing who I am and knowing what I can be, you know, and uh, and having it be realistic. And uh, so anyway, so I uh, so I got another little big book here. <laughs> I uh, I towed around with these small big books because I use them in the rehab when I go because they're always short and. Uh, this one, this is another one of my husband's old big books, and uh, I picked it up today because it's got a little sticker on it that was peeled off a prescription medicine bottle, and uh, for those of you that knew my husband, he did love prescription medicine. <laughs> he did love it very much, and uh, this, and this, this label on this big book says, oh, sure, you think I can read it, right? Take or use 
each dosage as is directed. Do not skip doses or discontinue. All right? So this is the 10th step, you know. <laughs> Don't skip doses, you know. And so, and, and so I guess that, you know, <laughs> like they talk about steps 10 through 12 as being maintenance steps. And, you know, um, you know, it's funny because I think, um, you know, maintenance is breathing. Maintenance is living. Maintenance is going through our day. And, you know, being alcoholics, we need steps to do that, right? <laughs> and uh, because, you know, we slide off the path, right? That's, that's why we need steps, because we tend to slide off the path. And so, um, you know, when uh, – last, last week I was talking a little bit about that phrase, change or die. And I think, you know, I was kind of um, brought up in AA on that – on that kind of a thought. Um, I remember when I first came around to meetings, um, they used to say, uh, don't drink and go to meetings. That was a big thing. It's still a big thing. People say that, you know, meeting makers naked. And, you know, I didn't see, I was going to meetings for some time and wasn't feeling any different. And, of course, because I wasn't any different. Right? <laughs> In fact, I was worse because I was not drinking. So I was literally worked because, um, you know, I had the real problem still going on, which was me, and I had removed my solution to my problems, which was alcohol and drugs, and now I was just stuck with me, and uh, and I didn't and I didn't get it how I was going to get sober um, drinking coffee in church basements, and I remember they said, you know, the uh, sobriety is in the ashtrays, you know, so I clean up ashtrays. Um, I used to go home from meetings, you know, reeking of cigarette smoke, and my hands, of course, smelled of, you know, ashes, and I wasn't getting sober, you know. <laughs> I was getting, like, crazy, and uh, <laughs> and I had to come home and take a shower after every meeting because I smelled like cigarettes, you know. It was just, you know, so, so, so I started to hear about, oh, I, I, I went to this group up in Sea Caucus, and they said to me, oh, yeah, they didn't tell you the ending part of that phrase. It's don't drink, go to meetings, and change everything. So, excuse me? What did you say? Oh, yeah, don't drink, go to meetings, and change everything. Well, you know, they had never told me that before. And then I thought, well, that makes a little bit of sense. Because if if I don't change everything, you know, I'm going to end up, I'm going to end up a mess. It doesn't matter if I end up high or not, I'm going to end up a mess. You know, and I know, um, I know plenty of people in, in the program or out of the program who don't drink and they're a mess. And some of them go to meetings. My favorites are the ones that go to meetings like once a month. <laughs> and they come and they talk for like 15 minutes <laughs> on how they need to get their meds changed. And, uh, <laughs> those are my personal favorites. And I have to really hold myself back. I roll my eyes and I say, you know, they're just not there yet, right? Because they'll get there too because they'll reach a bottom with the insanity. And um, and, it's, and it's not in their time and it's not in my time. It's in God's time. And so that's, you know, that's kind of the only thing I want to say on the change or die is that sounds a little bit extreme, change or die, because... Anyway, there's nobody here that's not going to die, right? <laughs> and, you know, so it's like, you know, change everything is a little radical. Well, what if I change 90%? That 90% might be enough, you know. 20% may not be enough. And so I want to kind of amend that statement that I made last week about change or die and say uh, change or be miserable. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> use that as you may. So, um, so anyway, the tenth step, um, you know, I, I, uh, when I first read the tenth step, um, when I, very early on, you know, once I hit Sea Caucus, they gave me 12 and 12, they gave me the big book, yeah, I started attending step meetings and big book meetings regularly, and 
So I read the steps regularly, and I didn't um, I didn't always understand what the steps were about as I was reading them. I was told to wake up every morning and read a step in the morning, and read it before putting on my radio and before walking out the door. And uh, like I said, sometimes you change 90%, right? <laughs> so I never read it before I turned on the radio <laughs> or walking out the door. But I did get in the habit of reading it in the morning on the train on the way into the city. So it's like, you know, the... 90% change thing. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, um, so so I started reading, and I didn't understand all the steps. But what I understood about step 10 was that it was okay to make mistakes, that nobody expected me to be perfect at this program. And for some reason, that was truly, truly important to me. Like, I felt like I had hope because... I was going to, it was going to be okay if I made mistakes. In fact, I really like the wording of it, when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. It doesn't say if we were wrong. It says for sure we're going to be wrong, and all we got to do is promptly admit it. You know? <laughs> so I got real hope from that as a newcomer. And uh, I, unfortunately, I didn't really get the sap, right? So I, what I got from that was you could screw up, admit it, and then correct now, the correction, you know, was kind of like the, the vague area for me. But, um, you know, it meant if I, like, screamed at somebody, I could say, whoa, sorry, I screamed at you. You know, and in fact, I started to read a lot about nightly tense steps. And I thought, okay, I could think about it at night. Okay, I screamed at that person. And the next day, go and say, oh, sorry, I screamed at you. See, I didn't get the step where it's supposed to be so you stop screaming at people. <laughs> you know, it took me a long, long time to get there. And uh, so so I, you know, used to key in on the final words in the 12 and 12 where it talks about spot, admit, correct. So I thought, okay, all I have to do is, you know, spot it where I screwed up, you know, admit it. doesn't always have to be to another person. Sometimes it's to myself and to, you know, my higher power and correct it. And sometimes that means going back and apologizing. Sometimes that means correcting something I've done badly, like redoing it. Um, and sometimes it just means acting better the next day, right? And I, um, and so I thought, okay, I can do that. So I started doing this like nightly review of everything I did during the day. And yeah, I really messed up that, you know, situation there. I'm admitting it, right? So I spotted it, I admitted it all at once. Great. Next thing I got to do is the next day I got to go and correct it. And then I fall asleep. And, you know, next morning I wake up. And um, I might think about it. And I might think, yeah, you know, when I get when I see that person, I'm going to, you know, talk to them about that. But then, you know, I get going in my busy day and I'm really not thinking about it because, you know, I'm living, right? And so... Um, then I, you know, get to that night's inventory, and I'm doing my inventory, and I think, oh, yeah, I spotted something. I forgot to apologize for the thing I did the day before. <laughs> so it gets to be like a little cycle. And so then I thought to myself, this nightly thing's not working, and what I really need to do is do it in the day while I'm still near the person, so once I spot it, admit it, I can correct it right there. Oh, okay. So now I'm like, you know, now I'm rolling spot admit into one thing, and it's just like it goes from spot admit to correct, and then it goes to just admit and correct. And then finally, and it took me a long time to get to this place, and I'm not always there every minute of every day, it's just correct. Just stop doing the bad behavior. When you do it, fix it right away. And it's, you know, it's not... um it's not easy, you know. Um, it, it's not like it's not like I never, you know, do something that that makes me feel bad, that gives me shame. That's how I know. That's how I know, by the way, that I do something wrong. Because the way I spot it is, I feel something wrong inside me, right? So, so things like that happen. You know, it used to be like I would feel it later, and then find the person and fix it. And then it started to be like, as the words are coming out of my mouth, I'm like, oh, forget it. 
you know. And then if it comes to the point where I can feel the words start coming up my throat and I stop them from coming up my throat. And, you know, in the book it talks about restraint of pen and tongue. And I really had a um, – I really struggled with that. I'm pretty good at the tongue one now. Um, I really think carefully before I open my mouth, except, of course, when I'm, like, stream of consciousness in a meeting full of people. But <laughs> but I really think carefully, you know, before I open my mouth. I, I'm actually a little dangerous on email. And uh, <laughs> what, what I found out about myself, because this is about spot and incorrect, right? What I found out about myself um, is... I, I'm a bit sarcastic. I've always had like a sarcastic side to me. That's how I show my anger, is in sarcasm. And email is just a wonderful forum for sarcasm. And it's, it's good when the people you're pointing it at don't really get that. But unfortunately, sometimes emails get forwarded to other people and you don't know they're going to be forwarded, right? And sometimes the person they're forwarded it to actually gets the sarcasm and realizes that you're like really putting down someone and it can come back to you. And and it did, you know, twice since I'm uh, really using email regularly and uh and I um you know, I had to I had to say, you know, I was told actually by a manager of mine, you know, you have to be a little more careful what you say in email because you never know who they're going to be forwarded to a copy to. And I thought about it, and I, the thing that I, you know, had said wasn't really, wasn't an untrue thing. I mean, it was a, it was a true thing, and, you know, I stood by it. But there certainly was a way that I could have said it that would have been nicer. And I thought, you know, you can say something in a conversation, and later on, you know, people may forget it. But when you put it in writing, it's out there. You know, it's out there for everyone to see for years. You know, everybody's got it in their archives. And so I have, I have to be real careful. And um, what I started to notice was after 5 in the evening was when I sent out my more nasty emails. In fact, if people sent, because people send me emails, they want me to fix all their problems because they heard I'm a good fixer. So that's my reputation, right? So I'm a good fixer of everyone's problems, and I'm always really helpful and happy to fix everyone's problems. But, you know, you come to me ten times with the same dumb problem, I start getting upset. And so so what happens is the person comes to me with the tenth problem of the week, and they're, and they're nothing to do with me. They're just help, asking me for help from their job. You know, they're, like, reaching out for a lifeline. And I'm their lifeline. And they send me an email, you know, oh, can you help me with this, da, da, da. And, you know, I'm busy during my day, and it's not my problem, right? So what I do is I minimize that email. Five o'clock, you know, everybody goes home. And that's when I'm picking up those emails. I'm going, yeah, why am I staying late after five? And that person's gone, and now I'm going to fix their problem. So I, I would send out these interesting emails. So... A couple of times, and, you know, and the funny thing, the thing about email, too, is, you know, you can't get it back, right? So you hit that send button at 6 o'clock in the evening or 7 o'clock in the evening. It doesn't matter that that person's not there. You know they're going to read it in the morning. <laughs> so I, you know, I've had situations where, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything untrue. I mean, I'm not gossiping. I'm talking about work stuff, and I'm telling people, you know, you're not doing your job, you know. And telling them in a very strong sense. And, uh, you know, they, uh, and I really, so now I have a, a new policy of sending emails out after five is I write my reply, then I minimize that one too. I don't hit send right away. Get a cup of water, come back, open it up again, don't delete it, but I revise the language so it's much nicer in its delivery. Um, you know, because that, but, but that's how step time works for me. You know, it's like that story where um, there's a hole in the middle of the road, and you know, first you walk through the road and you and you fall in the hole, and you ask for help to get out, and then you know, the next time you walk, you fall in the hole and you crawl out, and the next time you know, you walk around the hole, and then the next time you know, you walk on the sidewalk next to the hole, and finally, you walk on another street entirely. You know, and it's like, I'm slow like that. Like, I gotta, 
I got to fall into a hole a few times before I figure out that's good. that's not good. <laughs> that's not good. And so you know, so email email was one I had to learn. You know, and learning sobriety. You know, they didn't have email when I was drinking. So uh, thank God, I can't even imagine the damage I'd have done then. <laughs> if I'm damaging now in sobriety, but you know, it's um. But it's about figuring out stuff like that, that, you know, my emails before five normally are fine, you know. My emails after five, I have to be really careful of the tone, you know. And that's, and those are, those are the things that I learn. And those are the things that, you know, I, I, I have to dig down and say, you know, where am I falling into holes in my life today, you know, and really figure that out. And then, you know, I mean, for the most part, I'm not doing great damage, right? Obviously, you know, I'm not stealing anymore. Um, the lion took a long time to stop. i got to say that right now. The lion uh, didn't go as easily as the booze and, out and, and drugs. But, um, but after a while, the lion went too, and I didn't have any reason to lie. And, you know, so um, I'm not lying. I'm not cheating. I don't even take pens home from work anymore. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm working on all those little things, you know. So now it's like at the point where, you know, I could say something that's a very true thing but in a hurtful way. And that's, you know, that's, that's a pretty good place to be. That's not, that's not too bad. So, um, but, you know, there's always, anytime I'm in a situation with other people, there's potential for me to do damage. Every new situation I'm in is a, is a situation I have to, like, kind of do an out-of-body experience and say, what am I doing in this situation? Where am I going with it? You know, what are the expectations, my expectations of the other person and the other person's expectations of me? And, you know, I have to see how I can act in a way that's not going to cause damage. And really, you know, that's the bottom line. And it's funny because, you know, so we have these 12 steps and they're pretty complicated and, you know, we do a lot, we talk about a lot of work, you know. But they all really, to me, come down to the golden rule that we learned in kindergarten, I think I learned it, was, uh, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So that's it. You know, we could have, I just could have just said that the first night and, Left to hang in for four weeks. <laughs> that's it. You know, that, that's, I gotta treat other people just like I would like them to have me be treat, have them treat me. So, you know, that means treating other people with respect. And that means treating other people with love. Because after all, I just wanna be loved, right? And so, you know, I, um, I read the, uh, the Course in Miracles, and the Course in Miracles tells me that my only job is to love. And when I, and I actually say that to myself many times every day, because I want to think my job is all. I want to think my job is to be the fixer, because that's what everyone at work thinks my job is to be, right? I'm the manager. I'm the fixer. I'm the organizer. I'm the one who figures out stuff. And my only job is to love. So, you know, if I am in a situation with people and there's a problem or an issue, my only job is to be loving and treat everyone in the room with respect. If the problem doesn't get solved, that's not about me. But if I don't act in a way that's loving and compassionate, then I'm a failure, you know. And uh I, we, we get these things at my job. I work for a big company. We get these quality quotes every day. And there was one yesterday that said, a man can fall many times, but he's not a failure until he blames someone else. And so, you know, when I walk into a room at work or, you know, any situation in my personal life, you know, there are a thousand ways that I can respond in a situation. But as long as I respond from a loving, compassionate place in my heart, I've won. You know, it's a good day for me. And it doesn't really matter, you know, 
if the problem gets solved, if the relationship works. If, it doesn't really matter. What matters is I came into it with love. And, you know, and that's what the 10th step has become for me. It's just, just that. That's the only question I really ask myself anymore is, what situations in my day could I have brought more love into? You know, and, uh, and that's it, you know. And on really great days, you know, I don't have a lot of situations to think about. I think, you know what, I was as loving as I could have been. Not being any kind of angel or anything, you know. Um, but, but that's, you know, that's the, the bottom line for me. And, uh, and it means that I can't think I'm better than anyone else in the room. So just because I'm the fixer and I'm the organizer, that doesn't put me above anyone else. The person who broke the situation and got us all in the room to fix the thing is just the same as me. And, you know, once I come into a situation in that kind of a spirit, I find that things fix themselves. Well, of course they do, because God's will will always be done, you know. And so the situation was never broken. And another, I, I had written this one down, another quote from the Course of Miracles that I like is, I don't have any trouble. I just think I have trouble. Yeah, right. I just think I have trouble, you know. And... I just think I have troubles because I want to have something that I don't have. Or I'm afraid somebody's going to take something away from me. For what? You know, I already said the first week I'm living on borrowed time, the time of my death was changed. For what? It all comes, it all goes. You know, I can't do anything to protect my stuff, you know. <laughs> Nothing I can do. You know, I try. You know, I got an alarm system at home. <laughs> Uh, you know, but, um, but as soon as I, you know, as soon as I let go of that idea that I have trouble and just imagine that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, that phrase that I always hated in early sobriety, and once I realize that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be, I don't have any trouble. I can't even, I can't even cook one up. You know, and so, uh, you know, so that's, so that's kind of, you know, and not to say that, that life is not full of challenges. Life is full of challenges. Um, and, uh, and that's where the 11th step comes in. So, um, a lot of times I don't know what to do. Cause, cause we're full, we have choices all day. Every minute of every day I have a choice. Right or left. Yes or no. You know. Coffee or tea, all that, right? And uh, excuse me, tea, excuse me. And uh, so sometimes I don't know how to act, and I come into a situation with love, but I still don't know what to do because I have to do something. I can't just love, right? I'm not just this loving being, and so that's when I have to ask for guidance. And, you know, the way I do it is to kind of get quiet with my with myself and just try to feel what the right thing is. And I think, you know, we get taught by our parents and who knows, we get taught right from wrong. But I think in, in a lot of senses we don't really need to be taught that. We already knew that when we were born somehow, you know. And because uh, some things that we get taught are wrong, we'll always want to do, right? And some things we get taught. So I don't know if the teaching is what it is. I think we really know. And if, if I can get really, really quiet with myself, I'll feel it and I'll know what's right. But, you know, it's not um, – but there are tough situations. And, uh, and um, I, I described, you know, a couple of weeks ago – how I was out looking for a job and I kept praying for this one job and, you know, and it, and it wasn't coming to me. And then when I stopped doing that and just started praying for, you know, for something good to happen, for, you know, God's will to be done, 
you know, I got this perfect dream job. And, uh, you know, in a lot of other ways, I had to learn about praying for God's will to be done. And one of my first opportunities to do that was my friend Ronnie, who I, I also mentioned last week, who had AIDS. And I knew him in early sobriety, and he was just the happiest person I ever knew. And he just, he, he, you know, he just gave me the gift of laughter. And, you know, when he was dying, when he was sick, you know, I was praying. I was praying for him to get better. I was praying for medicine to be invented that would get him better. And and it wasn't a bad thing to do. But, of course, it says right in the book that you can't do that, right? Because that's presuming that you know God's will. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> can't even do that. And it says right in the book, you know, you can't do that, <laughs> even when your intentions are good. And so I started praying for him to have the strength to get through this painful time. And, uh, you know, God has a funny sense of humor because what Ronnie discovered was that pot, the evil weed, <laughs> had a beneficial effect on the AIDS disease. He couldn't, because he didn't have an appetite and he was in such tremendous pain and his, you know, eyes were, everything was bothering him, but mostly, you know, his, his well, I won't even go into symptoms, but, um, so it was very uh, funny sense of humor because that was my favorite thing for many years. And so now I get to pick up Ronnie and, you know, he's thrown her in this giant bag of pot. And I and I know that God answered my prayers because God gave him what he needed to get through his last month. Because what he needed was to just not be in so much physical pain, you know, for his last month. And so, you know, you don't know how your prayers are going to be answered, right? And... uh I guess the big thing for me, you know, and this is, it's hard for me to talk about, um, the big thing for me was my um, husband. And uh, as well as I seemed to catch on to this program once I started working the steps, he couldn't. And he, and he tried. And, right, he tried. He had sponsors, he did, he worked through the staff, he went to commitments, he did everything he could, and he just suffered, and um, he would get some clean time, and then it would all fall apart again, and, you know, I prayed, tell me what to do, you know, do I call up, you know, guys I know with good sobriety and say, you know, pick him up, sponsor him, do I, you know threaten him, that if he doesn't go to enough meetings, I'm, you know, going to leave him? Do I control the money, you know, watch every dime so I make sure what he's spending? So, uh, so of course, what I did was all those things, right? Because <laughs> I didn't get any, you know, nobody, the burning bush didn't come, and I didn't know what to do, and so I did all those things. You know, I controlled it, I didn't control it, I, you know, Encouraged him to go to meetings. I didn't encourage him to go to meetings. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I went with him to meetings. I had him go to separate meetings. You know, we all these things. Therapy, not therapy. We did all the things that could be done. And, um, and I prayed. And, you know, honestly, I prayed for him to get sober. And then, you know, at some point, I just prayed for for it to be okay, for like our life to be okay again. And uh, you know, you gotta watch uh, what you pray for because um, you know it's, my life is okay. I mean, my life is better than okay, and I don't have to deal with that insanity anymore. You know, but it wasn't the way I wanted. You know, I wanted him to live, right? And, uh, you know, that was, that was, um, that was probably the hardest time for me to really know how to work in 11 steps. I couldn't, I couldn't stay out of it. I was in the middle of it. And, 
you know, I knew I couldn't be his higher power. I couldn't even be my own higher power. How could I be his? You know, so I prayed for him to get a higher power. So, uh, so now we got a higher power, you know. And, uh, and that's, and that's, you know, I guess that's the end of his story, but not the end of mine, you know. And so, um, it says in the book, you know, before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking. So, if I come out every day and I say, please direct my thinking, you know, I know it's going to be okay. You know, I know not all of us will live. Because this disease is a killer disease. And I know that we all will die one day. Right? Some of us will, you know, unrelated to alcoholism. It just happens. But I know that today, if I start out every minute of every day letting God direct my thinking, and I walk into every situation trying to come from a position of love, I know my life is beautiful beyond my wildest dreams. You know, and and I and I actually um you know and I can say that truly and you know um so I can say that this this program has taught me that through every it like says in the book, through every season of pain and suffering, new um I forget. Anyway. But new reasons to live or something like that. New lessons were to be learned. And that's how um and that's how I experienced that, you know. Because I guess I always wondered how I would be taken care of. You know, I know in the third step the word care is very important that I should feel cared for. And I, I know I talked an hour about step three, and you guys will never forget that. But <laughs> but, um, but the thing is that, you know, when he died, it was like the people in the program and, and his family, really, were there to carry me. And in a way that I literally could have been physically carried for the week. I really, I didn't know what to do, and um, and I didn't know, I guess every bit of my sobriety up until that point was always spent, you know, with this other person who was always bouncing in and out of the program. So, so much of my life was tied to that, and all of a sudden, that was removed. I, I literally had lost my anchor. And people came to my house and, you know, they brought me groceries and, you know, they made all kinds of, you know, arrangements and, you know, somehow um, somehow it all worked out so my, my daughter was okay and she was three years old and, uh, you know, somehow, somehow it worked exactly the way it, it should have. And, you know... Um, to this day, I wish it didn't happen. Of course, I wish, you know, something else had happened. But if it had to happen, it had to happen like it did. Because it happened while I was at work and she was at daycare at a babysitter's house, actually. And I came home, and I swear to God, I had a bad feeling. And I came home, and as I was a block from my house, I said a really desperate prayer. Like, please, 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 God, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Like, like one of those, I don't know what made me do a desperate, desperate prayer like that. But I just had a bad feeling. And so, you know, because I had that bad feeling, I didn't pick up my daughter from the babysitter before going home. You know, that's the way God works in my life. Not that he takes all the painful things away from me, but he arranges them in such a way that, you know, I can deal with it. And, and so, uh, so that's, you know, and, and I'll be, and I'm grateful for the rest of my life that she didn't have to come home and see, you know, him dead on the floor. And I'm grateful that he had a floor 
to die on because, you know, we were uh, divorced. And uh, he was living on, well, he was homeless. He was homeless, and he had come back to me six months before. And, you know, everybody said, oh, you can't let him live there. He's, you know, getting high and, you know, all that insanity, and you're divorced, and my lawyer's yelling at me, and my parents are yelling at me. And I said, I just can't put the guy out on the street. He could have been out there laying in some street somewhere, you know. That's how God works for me, is he let the man die with a little dignity in a place he called home, you know. And maybe, like, I have, you know, we always imagine ends of stories, right? And I had about a hundred different possible endings for continuations of the story of his life with me. And all of them, you know, were like, eventually he gets sober, right? All of them were that. But a lot of them had a lot of chapters of, you know, rehabs and detoxes and ambulances and cops, because we had already been going through that. And I think about it, and I think, you know, there were 99 ways for him to, to live a miserable life and die. And only one way for him to just get sober. You know? What's the chances that any of us ever get sober? There's like a hundred different ways for us to be out there killing ourselves. And there's only one way to actually get sober. And you know, when you think about it, I mean, because I could go out tomorrow and pick up and, you know, driving drunk and, you know, overdosing and, you know, having a knife fight and, you know, there's like, a million ways that I could be dead within a week and only one way for me to live. And, you know, when I think of the staggering impossibility of us being sober, it's just incredible, you know, and that's how God works in my life because today he keeps me sober. And so um, so it's all about, for me, understanding that the plan is good and uh and, you know, I know that's a, that's a lot of stuff for me, so I keep saying that's stuff for <laughs> My favorite. Um, but, you know, but it is step 11. It's about understanding that my higher power has a plan for me and a plan for everybody in this room, and the plan is good. And it probably is not the same plan we'd be thinking of. You know, <laughs> pretty high chance. But the cool thing about it is it's better than the one we could have thought of. It's better, and that's the incredible thing, you know, um, and that's something I learned in this program. You know, when they talk about being rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about me having a life that's so much amazingly better than I could have imagined. And, you know, hey, I wish I could be sharing it with a person that I love, but, you know, I'm sharing it with me. And I'm sharing it with everybody else who's coming along with me for the journey. And that's enough. You know, that's a good thing. So, um, so that's, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of my step 11 thing. You know, the other thing with step 11 is the St. Francis prayer. And I don't know what made, you know, the, what Bill Wilson, let's just say it, Bill Wilson put it in the book, <laughs> put it in the 12 and 12 book, but there it is. It's this St. Francis prayer. It's the only time, really, that he takes, like, picks up a prayer right out of Christianity and throws it into the book, you know, and uh, except, well, the Our Father is really like a fellowship thing more than, it's really not in the book. And so he puts that prayer in there for a reason, and it's an amazing reason because that prayer tells me what I need to do. It actually gives me really specific direction on my day. And, you know, before I was able to get to the place of, okay, every time I walk into a situation, all I have to do is love. Before I was ready for that, I was able to read the St. Francis prayer and say, okay, I want to be the light where there's darkness. You know, I want to be, um, you know, the, the happiness where there's despair, like all those things. And, you know, and it tells me how to do it goes back to the third step, 
freedom from the bondage of myself, right? It says the key is forgetfulness, is leaving myself behind. And it tells me that. It gives me really specific instructions. So before I was ready for, you know, that whole, you know, miracle of all we have to do is love, there was the St. Francis prayer to tell me what I needed to do in each situation. You know, if there's despair, be joyous. If there's dark, be light. And it's like, oh, okay. That's all I have to do. And it's funny because I first, you know, skipped over that prayer. I don't come from a religious background. I said this and, you know, if anything, I was born into a Jewish family and so didn't really have any, you know, feelings for St. Francis, although I knew the, you know, pictures of him, the statues with the, you know, like this, with the animals. And I like animals, so I didn't have an issue with St. Francis. It was, he was a good saint for me. And, uh, and I didn't, but I didn't really, like, I would skip over that part when I would read the 11th step in the morning. You know, I would, like, read it really quick and in early sobriety. And I remember when I was at this uh, one job, the job that was a very horrible, painful job for me um, when I was in early sobriety. When I got to this job, um, and it was my first, it was, I had had a job for 12 years, and then I went to this job. So I had a lot of, and I drank for all those 12 years, and then I got to this job, you know. So I had a lot of fear and, you know, all that um, low self-esteem and everything. And right away I walk into the job and they give me a cubicle, and it's an empty cubicle. There's nothing in it. There's no computer. There's no phone, you know. And it was a new made-up job, you know. So the first day I get there and they introduce me to everybody, and then they're like, okay, here's your cubicle. And then they will go about their job. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay. And hanging up on the wall was the St. Francis prayer. And I sat there the whole rest of the day, and I read it. <laughs> and I don't know, you know, there, there are no coincidences, like they say. That was there for a reason, because I had a lot of darkness and despair and unhappiness to deal with in that job. And somehow, and I never took it down, and I asked, you know, there were other people around me. In fact, there was a woman in the cubicle next to me who was kind of, like, very religious, like, gospel singer, Baptist, you know, kind of woman. And I said to her, did you leave this in my cubicle? And she said, no. I said, who left it here? She said, I don't know. I said, well, who sat here before? She said, oh. So, of course, I never took it down. So, thank God it was there my first day. I was nuts. I'm not a person who knows how to do nothing. And uh, <laughs> I had to go nuts. And so I was grateful for it to be there that one day. I kept it up there. And, you know, through that year and a half of that very, very awful, terrible job, you know, in the deepest, darkest moment, I was able to look at that thing. You know, and, and I don't know. You know, I don't know how these things happen, you know. But, um, but you know, well, to me, step 11, a conscious contact with my higher power. What that means to me is it's a feeling of being connected to the world. And because that's how I, I don't have a vision of a higher power of, you know, a big old guy sitting up in a cloud somewhere. You know, I don't, I didn't grow up with that. I, I can't make that. I don't, I didn't have that. And I know a lot of people have a lot of visions that come from their childhood religion. I don't have anything like that. I have, like, the grass that grows and the trees and the birds. And I know that sounds goofy and, like, you know, California-ish, but, but it's true. That's what I have. You know, that's, that's what I have is my higher power is, like, the world and the people in it. And, yeah, you know, so that crunches the world. So, you know, um, on that note, I'll have another quick my herbal tea. So, you know, um, so to me, you know, I guess my whole life I felt disconnected. You know, my whole life before sobriety, I felt disconnected. And even in early sobriety, I felt disconnected. I felt like it was a common bond between me and the other people in the room. But I felt like there was still something, a barrier between us. Only as I started working the program that I started to realize that there never was a barrier. There was just the wall that I put up. 
And you know, it took all the work, all the steps, and all the fellow. It took everything. It took the literature, it took the fellowship. It took working the steps. It took them all to break down the walls that I built up. And I can still build up these walls any day. Any day that I'm not feeling right about myself, build a wall. Don't tell anyone. You know, it's a much more subtle wall than it used to be. <laughs> you might not even notice it being there. But it's there, you know. And so, um, you know, so the days when I know, like I described that, you know, when I think about my 10th step all day and I think you know, I'm as loving as I can be, I'm as compassionate as I can be, you know. I'm not even thinking in terms of light and dark anymore. I'm just thinking that there's just this world. I'm here in it, and I'm here to love. And those days, it's all connected. And I realized that there never was a disconnect. And, and those are the days when I know it's all right, when everything's just all right with the world. And... And I have a lot of them. You know, honestly, I have a lot of them. Um, and I don't, you know, when, it, when it's not happening for me, I feel like, what am I going to do? i got to fix them. Something's wrong. Yeah, I start feeling like out of sorts. And uh, I started having days like that lately a little more than I was comfortable with. And uh, I realized it was because I had lost touch with my son never a good idea, right? And so, you know, first I, I started to look around. I said, well, you know, I'm losing touch with her. She moved two times away, you know. And uh, so I asked this other person to be my sponsor. And then I went home and I still felt disconnected. And I thought, no, call your sponsor. <laughs> Don't just jump to a new one. There's nothing wrong with her. She just lives two towns away. It's not even a different area code, you know. <laughs> It's like uh, cell phones, you know, you got free weekends, right? So, uh, you know, so I did that, and, and I felt immediately connected. I, I felt immediately like I broke down the wall, you know. Um, so I guess I'm going to say that brings me to the 12th step. And uh, the 12th step is a mouthful. Probably you need another hour to that, but... Um, but we won't do that. <laughs> um, I like how the 12 step is worded even. You know, I think people say, you know, hold on, 12 step call, right? What? Like your whole life is a 12 step call. Aren't you supposed to practice the principles in all your affairs? How do you do that on a call? You know? <laughs> what is that all about? <laughs> you know, but the chapter itself in the 12 and 12 is tremendously long. There's a whole chapter devoted to working with others in the in the big book. But, like, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot. And I love the way he says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And, you know, when I first, I used to always repeat, you know, I read, actually I read how it works out loud with the guys that said we have every, uh, well, whatever. It used to be every week, now it's every month, and we read it out loud all together. And I always used to say, as a as a result of these steps, it just came. And one day, I actually read it. So, you know, you get so used to saying it week after week, you don't read it anymore. And I read it. And I said, the wait, the result of these steps. So you know, typical of an addict, he waits until the end to tell you what the goal of the steps was. You know, we, I, I do a lot of project work in business. Usually, before you start your first meeting, you know what your goal is, right? You've got an objective. See, they trick you in AA because they tell you that your objective is to stop drinking. <laughs> and then you get to the end of all the work, and they're like, oh, no, the objective was to have a spiritual awakening. Yeah, so, uh, so that's a little tricky there. You know, it's a, addicts are very manipulative. So, so, and we, and we, you know, follow through with the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, I just keep working the steps. Yeah, they will get better. <laughs> and then they get to the end and you say, oh, yeah, yeah, you had to do it me. That was the goal. That's what you were supposed to do. <laughs> oh, you know, somebody would have told me that in the beginning, I'd have run away. 
And that's why we don't tell people that at the very beginning. We tell them that the goal is to stop drinking. Because that's what we're going to hear in the very beginning. But the goal is really to obtain a spiritual awakening. And that means understanding that God can do for me what I can't do for myself. And um, and so it's funny because so in uh, <laughs> I like to uh, I, I I do these other you know I use a lot of literature and, and a lot of tools out there. And one thing I use is the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey and you know it's a whole business whole thing around it seminars and everything. And I like the Seven Habits. Um, one of them comes from the St. Francis Prayer. Seek to understand rather than to be understood. I always think that's the best thing in there. Um, and one of them is first things first, an AA slogan. And uh, one of them is begin with the end in mind. So I think to myself, well, what if I was beginning with the end in mind? What if I actually knew that I was trying to get a spiritual awakening? And I actually began with that. Well, like I said, I would have run away. But let's say I, w- I wasn't going to run away. <laughs> So we have a thing in business, you know, that we call smart goals. We say a goal can't be a goal unless it's a smart goal. And it has to be specific, it has to be measurable, it has to be achievable, it has to be relevant, and it has to have a time. So I did that little exercise, and I thought, does this meet that criteria? Is it a real goal, having a spiritual goal? And I thought, well, it's specific. I just said what it is. Doing things that I couldn't do on my own by allowing God to come in and help me. Um, it's measurable, and we in AA measure things by day count. We also measure by milestones. You know, a situation without being crazy, drinking, killing my sister. You know, those things. So it's kind of milestones. I had a milestone like that, by the way. Uh, in April, I went to Florida to see my family, and I go there a couple times a year. And this is the first time ever that I went there for eight days and never even had a single murderous thought. I was so happy with that. I'll tell you why. I shared that at a lot of meetings when I first came back. So that was a milestone for me. So we have, you know, we have very measurable milestones. You know, but most commonly the day count or the year count. Um, it's achievable. Here we are. It's so it must be achievable. Um, it's relevant because, why is it relevant? Because if I get to spiritual awakening, I get to do the next two parts of step 12, which is to carry this message and practice the principles in all my affairs. Because I can't do those two things if I haven't had spiritual awakening. Or I can't do them to the extent that God would have. And so, so that's how they're relevant. And now the time is a tricky one, okay, because we always say that a, a goal has to be measurable by a certain amount of time. Like, I'm going to do this by this date. So that's the tricky one in this program because it's not like human calendar time. It's in God's world. And, you know, it's all achievable. It's all measurable. It's all specific. It's all possible. You just can't control it, you know. And we can we can make meetings and we can work steps and we can do it honestly and do it sincerely and in God's time it will get lifted. The obsession will get lifted, the craziness will get lifted and you know, God will come in and do his work. And that's you know, that's for sure. I uh you know, it's funny because I was reading something I don't know. Or I didn't do enough anyway. Um, and I found a little pile of stuff and I found a for my husband. And it just shows you he's got more, way more sobriety stuff than me. Um, and it came from a little pile of pictures that he must have had in his school box. It's a little poem and it says, I walked along an alien path with eyes that would not see. I raged and cursed and fought against an unseen enemy. Anger and sorrow, pain and fear. All paved my tortured road until at last I prayed to God to ease my weary load. A light came shining from his heart, a light to help me see. 
my enemy came into view, the one I thought was so, so you know, um, so, I don't know. You know, how does somebody know all this stuff and, and not get better? But, um, but you know, it's clear that the time of my death was changed, and and I know that for sure. That you know, while I didn't try to commit suicide, I didn't have any real desire to live. And clearly, the things I did, the behaviors I did, were completely justifying. You know, drinking while actively, you know, while driving and using two or three other drugs at a time. You know, not, that that would normally be considered suicidal behavior. You know, um, just uh, uh, many, many things. And what I found out was that the reason my time of death was changed was not to get the dream job, which I did get, not to get the little angel girl, which I did get, and not even to get, you know, good friends and fellows. But the reason the time of my death was changed was so I could tell other people that the time of their death was changed. And, you know, and that's so clear to me. This is like the ultimate pyramid scheme. <laughs> this is it. It's like if you tell ten people a day that they can lead a better life, you get benefit from that, just like a pyramid scheme. Just in telling them. And then they tell ten people. And it's like cool because... You get benefit from all these people, you know, and uh, and that's and that's how this program works. It's like, you know, you tell people and you show them, and then they tell other people and they show them, and it's incredible. And it doesn't always, you know, it doesn't always work the way it to work. Right? So I, I did this um, rehab thing, and I, I used to do it years ago and go every week, and a lot of the girls used to come out and ask me to sponsor them, and. Boy, they would call me, you know, two weeks later, completely high, and they need money, and they're in, you know, crazy, adulterous sex situations, and they want me to pick them up and bring them here, and, and you know, and you think to yourself, you know, what did they hear me say that, thought, that they thought that I would want to get in the middle of that? But, you know, but it's funny that sometimes, three years later, I see them at meetings, and I don't remember them. You know, I've seen thousands and thousands go through this place. But they remember me. And they say, I'll never forget when you said whatever it is. It's something that I usually can't remember having said at all. And, you know, and they say, you know what, I never forgot that. And, you know, after I reached yet another bottom, I remembered what you told me and I did this. And, you know, they go on and they sponsor other people and they do their own detox commitments and, you know, and it just goes on and on and on. And that's why, you know, my primary purpose is to achieve sobriety and help other alcoholics to achieve it. It doesn't do me any good to help other alcoholics if I can't myself achieve it. And it doesn't do me any good to only hang out with sober people because they've already got the right. I have to actually know people who need to achieve sobriety. So I have to know people who still drink. And I have to not be afraid to talk to them. And to tell them that when they're ready, in God's time, there's a better life. And so, you know, so the 12 step means to me, you know, I have to go out and live. And by going out and living, People will see me and people will meet. And I have a bumper sticker on my car that says, um, first things first. And, uh, like I said, it is one of the seven habits of highly effective people. But everybody who sees that bumper sticker knows why I have it. <laughs> and I can't tell you how many people come running after me at the train station and say, oh, can you find a bill? You know, I just moved to town. And, uh, you know, I'd love to go to meetings. Or, you know what, I moved to town three years ago, and I just haven't got around to going to a meeting. I'm like, come with me. <laughs> Let me write down some places to go. 
And, you know, so, so it means I have to be out there and living. And that's the main thing. Is, you know, I have to go out there. I have to try. I have to be, you know, I have to be ready for somebody else to think, ooh, that's amazing. You know, I have to be okay with that because, you know what, if I'm not out there and I don't have that sticker, no one will know and they won't know that there's a there's light, you know. And so, so that's the charity message. And the practice these principles, you know, it's, uh, you know, it means showing up four weeks in a row here. <laughs> it means when you're supposed to show up somewhere, you show up somewhere. It means that, you know, it means that when you're asked for help, you give it honestly and sincerely. You know, it means that if you're not asked for help, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> It means, because I want to fix everybody. And I'm um, the fixer, I thought that. Um, so, you know, it, it means for me to practice these principles in all my affairs means literally the building. I have to treat other people. I would like them to treat me. And it's so simple. You know, and I complicate it. And, uh, and I have to do it every day, just like this book tells me. I can't skip dosages. I can't discontinue. Because um, I have a very wise friend of mine, and he told me, all my insanity can be refunded in full. All I have to do is eat. So every day, I get busy. But you know what? I don't want that for me today. And, uh, and, that's, and that's the key. You know, when I was using out there, I was busy every single day. And you know what? I'm busy. I get busy in the morning, and I get busy all day. And there's not a day that I can say, oh, I have a day off from the program. I don't have a day off. You know what? The day I have a day off, I can tell myself the next day, two days off is better. Right? Before you know it, I'm one of those people that says, oh, I haven't been to a meeting in three years. I wonder why everything's going screwed up, and I hate everybody. All my insanity can be refunded in full. All I have to do is nothing. So thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.